Sound check, sound check, sound check, sound check, sound check, sound check.
Hello, hello. We're all set up with all the other stuff, and then once you're ready to get your lesson material set up, we'll help you with that. Okay. And we start at eight. At eight. The only thing I see when there is a casino on this form is Social Security. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, she did set the leave that way. How did Carson do? Were you here for that? Um, a little bit of it. It was good. Yeah. You know him? Yeah, I, I'm the one who, who recommended him. Oh, cool. Yeah. He, uh, he and I used to work together. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was a good get for that topic. I'm glad you recommended him. Yeah, it's hard to find people who are engaging and entertaining on that topic. <laughs> He's one of the few. <laughs> At least he used to be. I don't know if I, I haven't seen his stuff. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a pretty smart guy. He does some cool stuff at Microsoft. That's awesome. So, yeah. yeah. How many people in the class this year? 38. Big one. I know. It's a, it wow. is a big one. All right. We've got a lot of applicants this year. That's awesome. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, All thanks to Philip. He is the guru of the corporate marketing. Is world. that right? Yes. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> That's great. So how, is it, how is it going to do it again now? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was like, I have so many applications to review this year. We're like, it's a good problem to have. Great problem. <laughs> it's yeah. a good problem to have. Right. <laughs> ah, so many people. I might have to reject some people that are pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Well, I know it, it hasn't always been that way every year, so mm -hmm. well, that's a good problem. I'll get out of your, your, yeah, you're, you're teacher area. You're good. fine. I'm going to be there all day, so. Do you want to go downstairs and get some breakfast and coffee and all that before we get started? Uh, sure. Okay, cool. Let's do it. What's Philip? Do you want to run through that real no, quick? No, you're good. You're good to go. You're good to go. All right, awesome.
end up like going into a hotel situation or a bachelor's quarters, he decided to just rent a camping space um, down at Lake O'Neill on Pendleton. And so every morning he would just get out of the bed of his truck, go for a run, go shower off at the pool house. And because he was getting the uh, Housing allowance, and which you know, significant a couple grand a month. Uh, and instead of spending that couple grand, we're spending maybe a couple hundred dollars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> big time. Big time. All right, big time. All right, your return. I need some high dollars. Oh, did you guys want this? I'm just assuming we're going to need it. Yeah, we'll so, need it. Yeah. If this needs it, then. Please. I will be. Yeah. I'm not sure we'll be on stuff and things. Stuff and things? Yes. I love that podcast. Stuff and things? Yeah. I've never heard of it. Yeah, it's a magnified thing. I have no clue who that is. Nor do I encourage their participation in this program. Crikey, So you what you already know? Yeah, I'm broke. Oh, <laughs> I'm done with me. No, I don't think that. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, <laughs> no, they are not. She's a wrong Yeah, it really is. 
So we're recording audio on that funny little stand over there and then this is the mic so you can either clip it onto a lapel or just wear it like a lanyard and it'll pick up all of your dialogue from the lecture. I emailed Stacy so if she's not feeling totally like death today, she might get around to sending it out. We'll, we'll see if we hear from her or not. Poor dear. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's really nice because you have to get to see in the beat. You can charge a few different things at the same time. It's pretty handy, especially when you're traveling. Um, okay, so I should be all here, I think. Yeah, so um, we'll log in to Zoom, please. This guy right here. Oh, 
that's okay. Um, we'll just we'll just project from the screen share onto the um the. Yes, it's okay. Yeah. Yes. So we'll go into. Oh. Yay, okay, we have an internet. Good. <laughs> and we'll turn the meeting, and the meeting ID is 446-392-3769. And we'll do screen share. And um, desktop works for you. Fabulous. All right. We are in business. Perfect. Slides are 100 megabytes, 104. The first trip is oh, that's interesting. And then the last 57 are like 47. So, so I split it into two. I told you. Yeah. Thanks for Because cans or canvas wouldn't accept it. Okay. Oh, geez. <laughs> well, they should. It's a, <laughs> it's a learning management system. They should expect some pretty hefty stuff on it. Yeah, well, it won't, won't have up to 150 megabytes. <laughs> <laughs> And unless you want me to say something, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, that's lesson awesome. <laughs> Here's your mic. Okay, so just put this around. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Looks like everything is. Need coffee. Thank you. Okay, just wait a little. I'm ready to go. Uh, whoever you want to do it. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ken Grassi. I'll be your lecturer today. And uh, we're going to talk about service oriented architecture and governance of, of services. Uh, so I've been doing this for, I think, five or six years now. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but uh, I know you, you've gone through three days of pretty intense UML, I hear. Yes? Yeah. All right. So this will be a little bit of a change of pace. Uh, so that'll be a good thing, hopefully. Um, but we will put some of those skills into, into work. And uh, hopefully what we'll do is have a little bit of time this afternoon so that we can actually work on your projects. Uh, maybe one project. We'll choose one and just sort of begin to model that. Uh, in terms of the SOA governance that would be involved in that project. Sound good? All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about today's course. Um, we're going to talk, uh, we're, we're, I'm going to give you kind of a flyover, okay? Uh, this is a very broad subject. It goes really deep also. Um, so you will, you will get just enough to sort of navigate <laughs> your way through and, and 
be able to choose the deep areas of interest for your projects and eventually for the work that, that you, 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 know, you want to apply your skills uh, into your work. That's really the intent here. We're going to cover some of the major theories, some of the major practices, not everything uh, that there is to know about SOA or SOA governance. There's a lot to this topic. Okay, so um, that's, that's kind of the, the approach that we're going to take. Um, realize that there are a lot of different viewpoints on, on how to govern services. Um, and we are going to talk about one of the more dominant ones, Amazon Web Services. That's probably, hopefully everybody's heard of that, right? A AWS, unless you've been living under a rock for the last couple of years. Uh, so that, that's what we're going to talk about in terms of a case study. And that will be mostly this afternoon. Okay. All right. So uh, some of the goals, I, what I want you to do is, is be able to understand and practically apply what we're going to learn. So this is all about practice. Uh, we are going to spend some time in theory just to kind of ground you in, in, in SOA and SOA governance and governance systems in general. So I'll try to make that very relatable. Um, I am a practitioner. I am not a theorist. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about my background in just a minute here. I want to hear about your backgrounds too and some of the projects that you're, you're working on so that we can um, you know, really do a rifle shot and, and make this applicable to what you're doing now uh, and also in your job. So I'll try to tailor this uh, if there's a common theme here for all the students as best as we can. So you'll understand uh, what SOA governance systems are appropriate, when to apply those, uh, when, when they are inappropriate, which happens a lot, by the way. Um, out in industry. This is not something that's well understood or well applied, generally speaking. Um, we'll talk about planning, designing, implementing, maintaining SOA governance systems uh, all the way through the life cycle. And then we'll, we'll also, I'm going to give you some trusted sources to learn more. Uh, so because we won't be able to cover everything today, I'll, I'll tell you where you can go to, uh, to get some, some good stuff. Okay. So here's what we're covering. Here's what we're not covering. Uh, the foundational theories, I'm going to give you just enough, as I, as I told you, uh, a brief overview of the most common strategies. Uh, I will give you my practical perspective. I've been doing this for about 20 years, uh, a little over 20 now, actually. It's 2020, so 21, 21 years. Um, I, I'm going to try to kind of pour some wisdom into the class that way and just kind of tell you what worked for me, what didn't work. We'll go through a few stories uh, from real life. Hopefully I won't offend anybody who was a part of those or maybe knew about them. Um, but I think that's a great way to learn. And my objective here really is, is to get you to think the right way about this topic. So just to think the right way about it. Uh, what we will not cover, we will not, we are not going to get into engineering. Uh, we, we may touch upon that slightly, but we're not going to go deep into that. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you how to, how to build a service on Amazon web services. That's for you to figure out if and when you want to go do that. Um, it will not, we will not tell you everything you need to know about SOA governance. Uh, we will not look at any particular governance strategy in, uh, in depth. We will cover the more dominant ones uh, at a high level, but we're not going to go deep into those. Um, and uh, we, we're not going to cover all the topics from everybody's perspective. So vendor's perspective, that, that sort of, and, and enough to make you an effort, uh, an expert. We are, we, you're not going to be an expert <laughs> after today. Okay. So um, this is a long day. This is an entire day of this stuff. Uh, I'm going to try to engage you a lot. I hope that's OK uh, to keep you awake and going. Uh, I'm going to try to stay away from the slides as much as possible. We're going to run through some stories. I would love to hear your stories. Um, some of you have probably, you know, I see some gray hair out there. So uh, some of you have probably uh, lived through these things just like I have. And I want to hear your story, because that's what makes this real. And the objective here is to, to make it real and to, to make it practical. That's our goal, right? So if we, can, uh, if we can hear some stories and those are the things that stick with you, then let's do that. Um, I'd love to hear your questions as we go. Don't feel, you know, don't feel like you're interrupting me if you have a question, please do. If you have a question, someone else probably has that same question. So, uh, so let's just kind of have a conversation throughout the day. Um, I am a little bit Socratic, so I may call on people just to keep you awake and ask you tough questions. Uh, OK. Um, I, I don't know that we'll get to be able to critique in the time that we have, but in the past years, we've been able to do this sometimes, about 50% of the time, I'd say. Uh, that's really helpful, 
right? So if someone is willing to be brave and show us what they've got, um, we can, uh, we as a class can critique that uh, as long as that person has some thick skin and um, that's a great way to learn too. All right, so prerequisites, I'm assuming that you understand UML. Hopefully that's very fresh in your mind because uh, we will use some basic elements of that. Uh, assuming that you have a, a version of Sparks working, yes? Okay. Um, a, a basic understanding of enterprise architecture frameworks. Um, Bill and, and Hal were telling me that you really haven't covered service-oriented architecture yet, so that's fine. Um, I'm gonna give you a really simple way uh, that will hopefully make that um, very easy to understand. Okay, a very, very basic pattern that, that you can bring with you uh, that really simplifies it. So enterprise service buses, have you covered that? Yes, sort of, okay. We'll talk about that a little bit then. Uh, and so is security. I know my, my buddy Carson was here. I heard, uh, <laughs> I heard you guys went through that. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we'll talk, uh, maybe I'll try to summarize what he did because I know what he did is, is pretty detailed. So, um, okay, so here's the reference materials. All right, um, I, I would like to very quickly run through the introductions. Um, whoever goes first, if you could tell me about your team and just give me, you know, the 30 second spiel on what is your team project. That'd be great. Um, we, so I don't need to hear from everybody on the team. Just kind of one person, tell me about your team, whoever comes up first. Uh, tell me a little bit about your job, your professional background. Uh, that'd be great to hear. Um, anything that you, you in particular want to get out of today's course or you have questions about or that's confusing you, uh, that would be good for me to know. Um, I'll, I'll go first. So uh, Ken Griese, I already introduced myself, but uh, I uh, have about 21 years of experience, um, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I have been chief architect of, of some pretty big systems. Um, so most right now I'm uh, chief technology architect of our officer, CTO, of a, uh, a platform company called Glue, G-L-O-O. -O. Uh, it's a pers personal growth platform um, that's approaching a billion dollars a year. That's on the startup side. Uh, I also work part-time at a company called MITRE. So I work with Nick back there in the corner. Nick, you're sitting in the back, man. What's up? Yeah, well, my team is actually in the back. Okay. All right. You're usually right, right in the front. Uh, okay. All right. Must be me. Maybe it's me. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I was director of the system engineering practices office at, at MITRE. Uh, so that's our corporate practice of systems engineering and architecture, uh, about 8,500 people. Uh, I also served uh, with Dr. Ricks uh, at, at Spaywar, when it used to be called Spaywar, as the chief architect of the Keynes program, uh, which is a program that uh, consolidated and, and updated a, a bunch of applications and infrastructure for Navy, Navy ships and some of the ashore sites. I also worked at Cisco. I was chief architect for their services platform. That's a six and a half billion dollar a year business now uh, that we started back in 2012. Um, so I've done this a few times. Um, I've had a lot of successes. I've also had some failures uh, and we'll talk about those because uh, that's I think a great way to learn. So that's, uh, oh, and I guess uh, maybe a little bit personal. So married, three kids, lived here in, lived here in San Diego. Uh, we live in Poway just down the road. So it's a short drive to get over here. That's it. All right, who wants to, can we start at the beginning? Or, Nick, you wanna go? You don't have to come up, it's fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're calling. All right, um, so hey, my name's uh, Ken Miller. I work for Keyword Corporation, Keyword Engine Solutions in particular. Um, my current job is uh, I manage the sales engineering team for the rugged ISP division. So a lot of the uh, basement networking equipment for uh, on the move type situations, especially in the Army and Special Forces. Uh, our team name is Hyperion. Uh, we've actually changed it yesterday, so maybe the other one. <laughs> um, and the project's going really well. We had some major breakthroughs this week, uh, and we're starting to get into diagramming uh, the frameworks and, and everything else uh, since we've you know, gotten, uh, I guess, a lot more training on the enterprise market. Um, and what I want to learn from today's course is what the heck SOA governance is actually. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. All right. 
All right, I see how it's going to be. All right, <laughs> Miss, can we say? Oh, okay. James Dick, um, the Army Account Executive uh, for, for Cubic. Uh, so I'm on the entire Army Account. So I run just an account company. Um, I, used, I used to work at Fighter at one point. Oh, yeah. um, uh, I worked in the satellite industry for about a decade. Um, kind of like my job now. Um, I like our team. We have a solid team, very diverse uh, group. Um, so we have a lot of different per perspectives. It's helped a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I would like to learn about government. So I'm going to say thank cool. You. All right. Thanks. Um, All right, we'll start over here. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, uh, my role, I work in the, the cyber domain. Um, right now, we work with uh, NGA and data specifically. Okay. I'm from Hacker. Great. Um, so I'm looking to learn to see what do you know, what, I, what can I get from you? Um, how does it apply? We're, we're definitely expanding into the, uh, to the AWS infrastructure that we are uh, very good. Thank you. Chad O'Neill. Um, I work up at Hyper Tech. Probably you remember Stay War. Yep. So I'm a APM uh, for a C4I pro uh, program called Intelligence Cherry in a, in a stock program. Uh, I've had over 25 years in the military, five plus years uh, as a DOD civilian working ISR and intelligence. Our team project is actually focused on um, addressing some of the uh, life, cycle, life cycle sustainment issues, um, particularly um, life cycle sustainment costs and uh, mission readiness. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with like um, system uptime versus downtime. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to implement a technical solution that addresses those problems um, by leveraging some of the maintenance data so it will be definitely um, relevant to what we're trying to do. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, my name is Kevin Lamb, and uh, I work for Nibit. Uh, I'm an engineer. My team name is um, Nexus. What we are trying to do in our project is to maybe change the culture of Nibit. Wow. Maybe. OK. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, pretty much. All right. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Is it whatever? <laughs> we'll set going first. Oh, okay. All right. We uh, uh my current chief of what we're currently doing is uh, we work with the presidential satellite systems and broadband satellite and uh, so I'm working as part of the team that's helping support that service. We've actually looked into Amazon services pretty heavily over the last several years. Mm. So I personally am very interested to hear your experiences on this front. 
and uh, our GRT project is to help us deploy us a uh, into new markets. We're going to be spreading across many areas across the rest of the globe, so we need to find great services for new businesses to spin up here. Very good. Yeah, so uh, let, we should probably talk about things like GDPR, maybe for, for you, and kind of how that plays into governance. Yeah, yeah interesting. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Hauser. Uh, call me Chauser. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so I've been doing software development for about 20 years um, in a lot of different industries. Um, so most of my expertise is, is on the software side and not so domain specific. But, okay. Um, about the team. I work with John from the Biasat team. Um, and what, I, I guess one thing about the team is, is we also have a very diverse group. So you'll listen for us because we've got a couple software developers and then different levels of organization. It's been very interesting to me to learn from all different perspectives. So um, yeah, and, and governments is going to, I mean, it's clearly a, um, a soft spot in my understanding of, of, of how to do cloud computing. So. All right. Thanks. Uh, my name is Maria Sandoval. I work at Bay Systems as a SAR cloud engineer. I work in healthcare quarter, where before BA. I'm on the project Pi team, and I am not in uh, all ears. All right, thanks. I'm Ryan Gomez. I uh, work with Martha Grumman. I've been the systems engineer for the Dallas Energy Museum. Uh, and most recently, started working here with the Dallas Energy Museum. Mm -hmm. Not very familiar with SLA at all, so. All right. Sounds good. Um, Chris Children, uh, manager of software team here at uh, Beck and Dickinson, background in uh, software engineering. So we're sort of developing some new electronics and management cycles of our devices and getting more into the facility. Um, we're primarily running on Azure. Sounds good. Yep. All right. Uh, my name is Joe Murray. Uh, I'm from this J. Sounds good. I used to go to Seoul uh, pretty regularly in, in, with Cisco. So uh, yeah, missed the Soju there more than anything. But uh, yeah, sounds good. All right. What is Bartholomew uh, Perez, North of Bombdale? Huh? Uh, been in Oprah for two and a half years, transitioning from engineer to principal engineer. Uh, I'm also with John Bell, and the rest of the guys at the medical device platform. Mm -hmm. um, for today, I, uh, there's four properties with SLA. The one I'm interested in is the self-contained property. Mm. Uh, I'm just wondering what that is. Like. Yeah, we'll talk about that. That's a, that's a key part of it. So, uh, absolutely. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeff. I'm 
part of the uh, better than the team. <laughs> <laughs> is that the team name? <laughs> Our team name is the Beavers. We're okay. in the water polo. We're all about um, implementing ad building at the uh, North of the Piano Press level. Great. We're Harvard engineers. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my name is John Simons. Uh, in the industry, as a software engineer since 1993. Um, worked at a uh, initially, and then an investment company consulting, and came back to Gary, bought by Northwest. Uh, currently, I am a uh, functional head for software quality assurance for autonomous systems. Uh, our team project is just stated is uh, implementing Agile throughout the company. Uh, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement now they've done that the last couple of few years. I've been on a program that's implemented Agile and I've reached out to other Agile groups and I, I think there's a way to really speed that up. Mm -hmm. So I think we're doing good. And then for day, today's course, uh, one of the interesting things about SOA was a while back we were investigating uh, Dev Cloud and we had some work services mm -hmm. and we were set for go and then we found out that the uh, people that they contact at Oracle help support Oracle, mm -hmm. they didn't do background investigations on them. And so that was kind of a deal killer. So that, that was a number of years ago. So I'm sure they've gotten wow. uh, pulled back. Yeah, yeah, wow, that's interesting. Huh. All right, Hi. thanks. My name's Brian. Um, I'm a former engineer for a company as well. Um, I did some media ranking on some of the great work that I was um, also an agile team as well. And uh, it came up that SOA was starting to happen. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name's Mike Schmidt. I uh, mm -hmm. work for Nagra. I'm currently a project manager. Um, my background is in all action infrastructure. Um, uh, we're moving, the, the center has been moving into AWS extensively, so the whole solar thing is pretty important. Mm -hmm. so, um, I'll move to the class. Okay. Hi, good morning. Greg Ketzenberg. I'm um, an engineering integration manager on the F35 program for Northrop Grumman. Uh, we are the North of Drummond One team. Uh, <laughs> no, we're, not, we're the number one team. The best. Yeah, can't get better than one job. <laughs> um, our our uh, team right here, um, we are working on uh, how to implement resiliency in our space platforms um, better, cheaper, faster. Okay. Um, and uh, I know very little about. Uh, SOA, so I'll get to pick up as much as I can. Sounds good. My name is Mitch Rowley, also on uh, the Engine One. Uh, <coughs> I am a systems engineering manager for an unmanned aerial platform. Um, ready to just talk about what we're doing. Uh, I, I look forward to really diving into what SOA is doing better in our future. All right. Hey, I'm John Thompson. Uh, I also work here at Drone, and I have a background in mechanical engineering, and I'm a project engineer for a satellite. Um, and I don't know what SOA is, but I'm excited to learn how to use one of you. All right. <laughs> My name is Greg Doyle. I work at North Drone. I do system test integration and design, and I'm on the same team as these guys, and for SOA, I'm curious to learn about it as well as the practical times to use and not use it. Mm -hmm. I think the not use will be interesting to me because sometimes when you learn something, you just want to cram it certain places that it's not appropriate. Some right. Some of your examples that it's not appropriate as well. Yeah, good. Yeah, sometimes when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. Kind of a syndrome. Okay, sounds good. Good. All right. 
Uh, my name is Josh Slater. Uh, I work at Biostat uh, with Jonathan uh, and these guys. Uh, I lead the systems and architecture group for commercial aviation, um, in flight Wi-Fi business. Um, and this kind of work to is very relevant to this course in terms of working with these guys, partnering with other businesses and groups within Biostat to effectively re-architect uh, our our software platform over the coming couple quarters, years, even. Um, so that's what we're kind of bringing that into our team. So this is one one we talk a lot of work in our service oriented architecture team don't have that right now. Mm. And um, we need to kind of understand uh, what how, how to apply these practices. Uh, specifically, I hope we can talk a little bit maybe about microservices versus services uh -huh. um, and really be able to articulate the difference between those and the applicability. Sounds good. Yep, we will do that. Uh, Corey Johnson with Biostat. Something that I'm interested in bias that is a class organization. So there's a negative response to governance, maybe I should say, but, uh -huh. but obviously a program like what we're working on right now, where it's, it is a full enterprise and we are architecting our business system so we can roll really the governance is very critical. That's just apropos. Well, that, that'll be good. So the, the absence of governance is still governance. Yeah, we'll talk exactly. about that. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. I'm Brian Ivory. I'm also at Biosat with these guys. I run the product team for the Wi Fi Solutions, a program that brings uh, Wi Fi hotspots to remote villages. So, cool. Uh, talking more about GDPR, PII, in place of Wi Fi is very relevant. Hmm. I'm also interested in virtual services that handle workloads that are in flight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. We'll talk about that. I'm Trevor Buick. I run our uh, Inflight Wi Fi uh, engineering teams. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing about uh, as companies get to uh, Amazon type size, how governance plays a role and how much, uh, how much room innovation teams are left to break some of the rules uh, and what kind of guidelines are for bringing that back to the point. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll talk about that too. I know that guy. You already know what I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> um, I can tell you something new. I'm on a new like data science related project. I'm visualizing Chinese 5G and like digital silver investments for the Intel strategy portfolio. That's probably my cool. project. Cool. All right. Um, I'm on the Nexus team with Mike and Kevin. And these guys. Okay. Yeah, it's cool to be on the NIRA team and learn a lot about. Different government entities that I didn't even know existed. So. That's great. Yeah. Oh, I have a question for you. What's up? Are we <laughs> too early for a question? No, go ahead. <laughs> Are we going to? In my in my head, it might be wrong. Is an SOA just an architectural way of displaying APIs? Um. Yes, you can think of it that way. You think? We'll we'll talk about that. Yeah, I was gonna we will that. definitely. You can't talk about SOA without talking about APIs. So. Yes, we will. We will cover that for sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, sounds good. Good, thanks. Uh, Jason here. 
All right. Sounds good. Very good. Very good. Good morning. I am Brian Bessig. Um, I, uh, I'm on Team Lockheed Martin. I joined Lockheed Martin about two years ago. My professional background, like I got my degree in mathematics and computer science. So I'm a software engineer and I work on the Cochrane Submarine Radio Room program. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, I don't really know anything about SLA and governance, so I'm excited to learn about it. All righty. Sounds good. Thank you. Well, that helps a lot. Um, so we've got a very diver diverse group of people here, lots of different backgrounds, um, uh, some common interests, lots of common interests, actually. So this will be good. I think this will be a fun day for everybody. Um, it'll be a rich day. So let me give you a 10,000 foot view of what we're going to do today. Um, first, we're going to talk about why SOA governance is needed. And I'll, I'll give you a, a kind of a primer on SOA so that we can all be speaking the same language. Uh, we'll, then we'll talk about the governance strategies themselves. We'll have a little break. Uh, how are we doing on time, by the way, here? It is 8.40, roughly. Okay, so we're a little bit behind, but that's okay. Uh, then we'll talk about adoption planning, uh, governance vitality, in other words, how to keep this thing alive and well, because um, it is sort of like, <laughs> you know, a, a human body in a way. Um, you have to keep it alive and well. Just having it there is not quite enough. You got to keep it going, keep it healthy. Uh, technology can be helpful in instituting governance as an enforcement mechanism. Um, and then we will actually go through and build a, a governance strategy. Um, and what I'm going to propose is that we take one of your projects, whoever wants to volunteer, that brave soul or souls, maybe that A team you were, you were talking about. We'll see how A they really are. Um, put that to the test and, and we'll just kind of come up here and, and go through it. Uh, so that we can apply these principles to an actual real project. Uh, then we'll break for lunch. Um, we will kind of murder board the practicum um, after lunch. Uh, then we'll talk about some, some common patterns, um, service information, policies that, that would be uh, commonly used. Um, and we'll talk about when those would not be used. I heard, I heard you guys, you know, questioning, when, when is this not appropriate? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then we'll spend some time just very practically what works, what doesn't work, when does it work, when does it not work, why does it work, why does it not work, uh, we'll, we'll get into that and, um, and then we'll have an afternoon break, we'll get into the Amazon Web Services case study and then we will uh, continue if we have time um, kind of architecting and building out a, a governance system for a project. Sound good? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Everybody have their caffeine ready? Okay. Ready, set, go. Uh, why is SOA governance needed? So here we're going to talk about um, the need for SOA governance. And, and we're going to first separate SOA from governance. We're just going to talk about governance at first. Okay. So why do we govern things? How do we govern them? Uh, when should that happen? And uh, then we'll get into SOA. All right. So let's, let's kind of take this apart one piece at a time. Um, any, anyone major in political science here, by the way, or studied it? All right. 
Anybody passionate about politics? I see some nods. All right, no one wants to admit it. All right, um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try very hard not to take a position on anything, by the way. Uh, so why do we govern? Why do we govern something? Let's, uh, let's think about this. Well, uh, what do you think? Why do we govern? Regulate, yep. Control, control for sure, right? What else? Standardize. Standardize things because we want to, what, what would a standardization do for us? Make things equal, yeah, a level playing field. But things, yeah, exactly. Talking to each other, yep. Cost. What was it, cost? We think we know better than the government? Okay. Yeah. Risk, reduce chaos. Yeah, keep you safe, right? Um, so we can live longer, that, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, what about, you, you know, we don't want to be enslaved. Uh, we want to protect rights. So let me ask you something. Is there a difference between uh, controlling versus guiding? What's the, what's the difference? I'm trying to give you a goal to work for. Mm -hmm. So is there a time to guide and a time to control? Yes. Yeah. Give me an example of when, when one of those would be appropriate. I want no. to control to get the driver's license. Yeah, I was going to say, anyone parents here? <laughs> so, so as a parent, what's the difference between guiding and controlling? Give me an example from, from your parenthood. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> All right, very good. And when they get that driving thing, that's, that's more guiding, right? Yeah, okay. So do you see the difference here? Guiding, controlling, um, okay. So uh, regulating, we talked a little bit about that. We do this, we, we are all under a governance system. Actually, we're under multiple governance systems. That's what we live under if we're in this country or not in this country. Uh, we are being governed um, and we agree to that. We agree to be governed, right? Uh, if we are citizens, I mean, I just took the, oath, the patent oath here at UCSD to protect and uphold the Constitution of the United States and that of the state of California, literally this morning. Um, and here's my copy of it right here. So uh, yeah, that's a form of governance. So um, here's the preamble to the US Constitution. This should sound familiar to people, right? To form a more perfect union, ensure tranquility, promote general welfare and prosperity. What does that sound like? Does that sound like control or influence? Influence, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, how does this apply to architecture? Well, an architecture is, is literally just structure and behavior, right? So it's, it's comprised of someone and or something trying to solve a problem or pursue a goal. What does that sound like to you? An enterprise, yeah. What else does that sound like having to do with the constitution? Are we pursuing a goal? Yeah. What's the goal? Yep. Pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we have a governance system and we're gonna talk about the United States as, as a form of governance uh, because we have that all over the place. Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, so, when and how do we govern? There are lots of different types of governance models. Some are loved and some are hated. Um, you know, some are appropriate in certain situations, some are not. Uh, but there, there are two primary schools of, okay, uh, centralized and decentralized. What's an example of a centralized form of governance that, that is familiar to everyone in this room? We live under it. Which part of the US? What? Federal government is a centralized federal government, right? What about decentralization? We also live under that. State, local, municipality, school districts, right? Decentralized, although that's sort of centralized in a way also, but it's, right, because it's, it's sort of centralized for the region. But you're right, it is decentralized compared to federal. Why would we have both? What's that? Yeah. Right, are there differences between states? Yeah. Yeah, different, different local influences, 
would you say? Okay. Um, uh, let, let's think about who we're governing. Um, why would we do this? Why would we agree to be governed? What's that? Something good for us, yes. Avoid chaos? So yes, um, I, I, let's, let's go back to this something good for us. Um, there is a presumption uh, in, in SOA governance and in platform design that we'll talk about that you are using that platform out of self-interest. And, and think about this. Think about things like Facebook and other platforms, right? You can see how that's built around self-interest. There is a form of governance, but it's built around self-interest. Mm -hmm. So governance doesn't always mean restriction of freedom. Sometimes it can mean more freedom because you're able to pursue a goal. And that's what we would say as part of the US Constitution is actually this governance will give you as an individual more freedom. So you ab agreeing to be governed by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights actually grants you more freedom than you would have otherwise. Does that make sense? It's a little bit unintuitive to think, uh, I, I'm gonna bring in governance so that I can have more freedom, but that's actually what, it, what we're saying. What's that? Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, go for it. So, so imagine anarchy, right? You're in a neighborhood, um, and all of your neighbors are stronger than you and have bigger guns than you. You're going to have to do whatever they say, or like if you're a mob kind of situation, right? You have, if the government is not strong enough to protect you, then you are under the control of non government things that are going to prevent you from doing what you want from pursuing your own life. Mm -hmm. So if you have a stronger government you can participate in, you have influence over, then they can give you the space in order to have however you can use any any method you can think of and achieve to get around it. That's right. So I think we'll put on this one of the proposals that we can do. That'd be interesting. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that is the case, but uh, yeah, that's right. So someone earlier mentioned kind of the a, 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 a regulation of a, a flat playing field. Everybody's equal. We, we can all pursue things at an equal sort of uh, starting point as much as that's possible. There's a reason, right? Okay, yeah. So you just used our two key verbs, control and influence. And that, those are the two reasons why you would want a governance system. Something that you want to either control or influence. Those are the two key. So depending upon what you want to do, um, there are areas that you may want to control. You may not, and you probably don't, want to control the entire system that you're building. But there are probably some areas where you want to have complete control or some degree of control. And there are probably other areas where you want to have some influence. Okay, so um, now this, this is a common, I'll call it an anti-pattern in SOA governance. I'm going to control everything. Or I'm not going to control, control anything, I'm just going to influence everything. Both of those are probably wrong in, in almost any circumstance. So, so one of the keys that I want you guys to think about, and remember, my, my objective here is to get you to think the right way about this topic. What areas do you need to control? What areas do you need to influence? Think about parenting. So I, I don't know about you guys, I have a 15-year-old. Uh, my job with him now is more influence than control. I can, I can exert very little control over him, right? I also have a 7-year-old. I have a lot more control over him, right? Um, so what's going to work and what's not going to work also. So the constituents that you're attempting to control and influence. If you want to control them and they just, you know, you really don't have the mechanisms or, or the wherewithal to control them, is that going to work? No. No. 
So you have to understand your audience. And the first key to, to architecting is understanding back to this, right? The definition, what is the goal or what's the problem we're trying to solve? You need to be clear about that, Who, who's involved? Because that's gonna tell you what you're able to control and what you're able to influence, okay? Seven-year-old versus 15-year-old, make sense? Okay. How about right. the let it be component is kind of interesting because then yep. it's kind of disconnected from the self-interest and not just what the potential is. Yes. So um, there are some things that, uh, so first of all, let me, let me say it this way. This will cost you something. So governing, attempting to influence, attempting to control will cost you something in terms of systems, system resources, if nothing else. Uh, but it will literally cost you time and money and effort. And you have to make a choice and, and you have to figure out, is this worth controlling or influencing? What's my goal? What's the problem I'm trying to solve? Maybe it's best if I just kind of let this thing, leave this portion of it alone. Okay. Um, so, so real quick, an example might be, um, you, you know, the friends of my seven-year-old. Is it really worth my time to try to control or influence them? Probably not. Probably not. I'm not as invested in them as I am in my, my child, right? So I'm gonna let that be. Okay, next question? Okay. Okay, makes sense? Kinda, sorta? Any other questions about this? All right, so lots of different uh, models here. We have democracy, republics, aristocracies, monarchies. We have anarchy. Anarchy is a form of governance. It's the strongest survive, essentially. And sometimes you may want that. I mean, that that's, in some ways, you can equate that to capitalism as a form of governance. Whoever is the most dominant is going to get the most resources. And sometimes that's appropriate. Sometimes that, that's a good thing. Um, you know, not when your head's being bashed in. Maybe it's not so good for that guy. But, um, you know, that, that is an area where uh, we may want things to emerge and sort of become dominant over time. So th that's the key is to think about where do we want to control, where do we want to influence, and where do we want to do nothing? Okay, so those are our two key verbs, control, influence. Yeah. Would you say that let it be areas sort of like defining the boundary of your, of where the edge of where you want to be there? Uh, absolutely. A, a boundary is definitely you're letting it be <laughs> outside of your boundary for sure. Uh, but there may be areas within your boundary that you want to um, not restrict or influence in any way. Okay. Yeah. I would, so you, you've mentioned parenting a couple of times. It seems to me that um, parenting in particular, uh, sort of a meta goal is to move through a progression of those, starting with control, as you mentioned, and then influence, and finally, fully hands off. And if you're not progressing through that, then that's something that needs to be addressed. Yes. Does that kind of progression apply at all in the enterprise context? It absolutely does. Yeah, great point. So um, yeah, your, your, gov your governance strategy may shift and change over time. And, and you may say, hey, at first I want to really tightly control this piece and then I'm just going to kind of go hands off. Yeah, there, there are times where that may be appropriate. So your governance strategy may, may shift a little bit. And typically, this is in response to what's happening around the boundary of the system that you defined. And the problem uh, that you're going after or, or the, uh, the, the objective that you have back to the goal of architecture, right? So you are constantly adjusting and responding to the things that you're observing. So think about your own environment. This is how we live life, right? Um, what, what, which one is going to drive you to respond? Um, something like we're at war in some other country or someone breaks in right now and attempts to steal your laptop. Which one is going to get you to kind of react? the one that's closer to your sphere of influence, right? The one that's closest to you. So think about this in terms of localized actors, right? The, the individual, we're doing things out of self-interest. The closest you get to something that's being governed, um, the more careful you have to be because that, that thing is gonna respond to the, to the way that you wanna govern it. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so there's usually, and we'll get into this a little bit, but there's, no, that's probably way too small. 
there's an um, atomic element in that architecture. Um, there's kind of a, the boundary around that, and there may be systems and functions around it. There may be an enterprise. There may be a country. And, you know, so think of this as um, GDPR or HIPAA compliance, right? We, we kind of need to cross all these boundaries until we get to the top. You, here in this room, the atomic element, right? So there, there's things that the closer we get to this, the more you as the atomic e element are going to respond and care about those things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about this? Okay. So remember these two verbs, control, influence. There's a time to control, time to get influence, time to just not do anything at all. Okay. That's, a, that's important. Um, actually, one other thing um, that we probably should talk about. Uh, y y there are boundaries between things. Um, I think someone mentioned this, like interoperability. Who said interoperability? Okay. So great example of that is, is states, our states, not is, our states. So we have states that are part of this union, different laws, but there's things like, can you drive from one state to the next state? There's reciprocity, right? So we have, that's a form of interoperability. Um, there's reciprocity for your driver's license, your ability to drive from one boundary to the next boundary. Um, does that apply to everything? No. 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 Where does it not apply? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Texas. <laughs> Texas and California are pretty different when it comes to that sort of thing. Yeah. Why would that be? Culture, yeah. Yeah. So there's this fictitious thing called a state boundary line um, that we just ar so somewhat arbitrarily draw, right? And the laws of, of that, uh, that thing, that entity, um, are different from one to the next. Some of those carry over, some of them don't. So Nick, you asked the question about APIs. Um, in, in our, in, if we were to draw kind of the, the United States, um, as a set of services, the boundary would be, would coincide with the state boundary. And that API would exist right at the surface. Okay, the application program interface would exist right at the surface. And what an API does for you and what a service does for you is it just tells you kind of, hey, it's California, you can't bring your gun here. Or, hey, it's Texas, bring your guns. Right, right at the surface. So we don't need to know what's happening behind that surface. We don't need to know why. We don't need to know how it all works. We just need to know that, hey, this is, this is a boundary and this is what it's advertising. And that's kind of the beauty of services in general. We'll get deeper into this. But anyone ever heard of, um, of like a stovepipe application uh, or monolithic application? Um, okay, so in that type of a structure, you really need to know all the different offerings within there and how they work to really use it effectively. With something like a service and an API at the surface of that service, you really only need to know how to discover it, and it will tell you right at the service contract level at that API service what you need uh, in order to use the functions of that service. Super, super, super simple. I don't need to know anything other than that and just feed that thing what it's asking for and it runs and does its thing and returns its returns the result. I don't need to know how it works, okay? We'll get deeper into that. All right, so uh, governance, here's what we're dealing with. First of all, it's the who, um, both human and non-human actors, who are we dealing with uh, that are interacting with our goal uh, or with our problem that we're trying to solve? What, um, so we should always have a scope, we should know what's in scope and we should know what's out of scope. And, and this is a big problem normally. Uh, so you need to spend some time here. And, and what is also expressed in the architecture as structure and behavior. So let's, let's talk about structure for a second. Let's go back to our United States example. What would be an example of structure? You, you've talked about, we've, you've got, you guys have covered UML, right? So we literally have structure diagrams and behavior diagrams that describe each one of those concerns. So give me an example of structure. Okay, laws. Yeah, totally. Yep. What else? We've talked about it, actually. We talked about inter interoperability of states, right? States. We have these things called states. They're structured, right? 
Okay, what about behaviors? Give me an example. Culture, yeah. What's an example of a, a cultural behavior? Yeah, yeah. So we're influencing behavior, right? Some things are tolerated, some things are not. What else is an example of behavior? What's that? Religion. Okay, yeah. Tradition. A what? A trade. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, so these are, these are the actors. Who's behaving as part of the structure? Yeah, we are. We are. <laughs> um, give me an example of uh, behavior that is controlled. That's an area where we let it be, supposedly. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So that's a, actually an interesting example uh, because we have that First Amendment thing, right? That says you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh huh. Yeah, and that takes the form of a a law. A law. A law restricts behavior. Right? It controls it. What What's an example of influenced behavior? Not Not law, but influence. What? Oh yeah, that's well. Yeah, that's good. Speeding. Speeding. Uh, I would say that's that's more control. Uh, what? Okay. Okay. There's some laws there too, though. Social norms. Yeah. G give me an example of a social norm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's an influenced behavior because we want to be kind to each other. We want people to be kind to each other because if you can't pursue happiness or if you, if you want to pursue happiness, you want to be treated kindly, the golden rule, that sort of thing. Like we, we try to push that as a society. Well, at least most of us do. Some of us do. Okay. Make sense? All right. Uh, when do we do this? There's design time and run time. So uh, did you guys talk about this at all? Design time, run time? Okay. Uh, the forefathers lived in design time. We live in runtime. Well, sometimes we live in design time. Okay, so, so in design time, uh, we're not actually under the rules yet. We're figuring out what the rules should be. Uh, we're figuring out what those social norms should be. Runtime, we're actually living in it. All right, uh, where? What are particularly at the interface points? So this is SOA governance. I'm gonna bring in the SOA part now. Uh, SOA is all about interfaces, all about interfaces. An API is an interface. A state boundary is an interface. So we are not as concerned about what happens behind that interface because that's really the job of the engineers. For us as the architects, it's about defining what are those, hey, do, are we gonna have states? Like let's act like we're the forefathers and they are the architects of our company, of our country, not our company, our country uh, at, at design time. So they define these, this thing called the state. And that, that state for us would be kind of like a service, right? It has boundaries, it has laws that govern it. It probably has some influence, some social norms that they wanted to push. Um, things like uh, what, what, what shouldn't be done. Like you should not restrict uh, your, your, your speech. You should not have a restriction there. So it's sort of the reverse. It's, it's control, but in the opposite direction. Don't do that. Okay, um, again, it's usually not everywhere or nowhere, usually. Uh, so why do we do it? Architectures involve someone or something that we wanna control or influence. Um, and an effective architecture identified points of control, influence, and in intentional lack thereof. Uh, so how do we do it? Back to the patterns of centralization, decentralization, so just like there are areas where we want to control and influence. There are some things that we may want to centralize and some things that we want to decentralize, like we've just talked about. The forefathers were smart enough to recognize that, hey, there are local influences. There are different things happening in these different regions of the country, and we should allow for that. 
But at the same time, we want to have this centralized governance structure where we deal with certain things uh, that cross state boundaries. Yeah. So you mentioned the design for the mountains, but mm -hmm. the framing of the current constitution that encompasses about 20 years of the Lund's land environment for the Arctic Federation, in which they were suffering with their current Lund's <laughs> And yeah. so they weren't just looking forward, they were looking at the current state of things and realizing they, they wouldn't get by in if they didn't have that concept of a state system yeah well and we're all products of our environment at least to some extent right so we're going to re be reacting to the things that we like the things that we don't like and that's a reason back to uh, whoever asked the question about would this change over time yeah it might it might right Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's an argument and I don't want to go too deep here, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's an argument for things like the electoral college or even, um, you know, representatives in general, that those, those things are, could be outdated, right? Because what they were originally intended to do is to represent groups of people, which wasn't technologically possible, uh, any other way at that time. So we elected people to represent their constituents um, in, in, the, in the legislature to create laws and, and influence things. Uh, whereas now we probably, you know, could, we could probably, if we wanted to, we could vote on all the laws ourselves pretty easily um, and, and do a popular vote and have that be pretty accurate using technology. But um, I don't want to get too deep into that. Well, so I think it might be related though, but relevant to us is that the structure that we have now was somewhat representative government situation. And so they couldn't do everything they wanted to because they wouldn't have been able to influence, right? They didn't have control and make people adopt the new constitution. So they had to be attractive enough to be influential. This is where they were. Well, right. the, well, for the articles of confederation, they were. But uh -huh. for the constitution, they were already, right? They were already under, the states had some say in how the constitution was going to, whether it was going to be ratified or not. Yeah. Right, so they had to make it be attractive enough that the states did that none of the states wandered off on their own because then the whole enterprise was there. Yes. And I'm wondering for for us, I think it's somewhat similar. We as we are trying to mm -hmm. architect our governance, we have as much influence as we have and no more. Yep. And that may restrict what options we have, even if we can imagine a vision that we think is better, that we think will be better, but if we can't get by and if we can't influence or control yep. the current structure, we can't get where we want to go yet. That's correct. And so uh, just, to, just to put a fine point on that, this monarchy tried to govern things from afar. Right. That didn't work out so well uh, because the people that he was trying to govern, King George said, ah, we don't really like what you're doing and we're just not, we're, you know, we're not gonna be governed by you anymore. So see ya. Uh, and and uh, th there was an incompatibility between that approach and the govern constituents, right? And, and that didn't work. It just didn't work. Um, so if he had changed things, maybe things, you know, maybe we'd be, you know, part of the, the UK still. And we have just gone through Brexit ourselves. Okay, so yes, um, yeah, things need to be, you need to think about what is going to, uh, what are you governing? And is this gonna work or not? Be realistic about that. So um, how are we gonna do this? We're gonna use patterns for centralization, decentralization. Um, there, there may be different pieces and parts in our architecture where we decide to centralize or decentralize. Um, things could be deterministic or non-deterministic. What do I mean by that? You will, be, you will have a set of plans or guidance that they Uh-huh. So um, this is actually tied to emergence and we're, we'll talk a little bit about this. You guys, this is important for you to understand. Um, let's think about our, our transportation system. Red means, green means, stay on which side? Right, except when you're in the UK. And then you go on the left side. 
Um, from those very simple rules, we have extreme complexity that arises from those very simple rules. So if we look at our transportation system, it's all connected. Could you, could you build me a 2B architecture of the road system in the United States in the year 2050 and be accurate? No. Why not? Because we have no idea what roads are going to be built when some communities may pop up. We don't know where that's going to happen. Um, road systems will form around that. But what, what, is the, what is the control that we exert here on that governance system? Well, what, there's, there's just a few simple rules, right? Very simple. Very simple. Red means stop, green means go, stay on the right-hand side. And there are a few others, like the hexagon signs and things like that. But, but in general, the rules are extremely simple. And look at, look at what arises from that. It's a very, very useful system. Um, it's emergent in nature. And is that okay? It works pretty well, actually. Let's, let's also think about the internet. There's, there's only two rules for the internet. That's it, only two. It, it's expose yourself as a node, connect to another node. That's it. Everything on the internet has, has a, that's what IP is, the internet protocol, right? Expose a node, connect to another node, that's it. And yet we have this incredible emergence. Could you build me a 2B picture of the internet in the year 2050? No, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's purposefully intended to be emergent. So there, there are some things that are discrete and deterministic. There are some things that are purposefully non-deterministic and emergent. Uh, emergent is, is bigger than just determinism, but um, non-deterministic is, is part of it being emergent system. Oh, is our country emergent? Yeah. Yeah. So those, those the things like the Constitution and the Bill of Rights mm -hmm. and all of that stuff, that's kind of non-deterministic, right? It's emergent in nature. They, they didn't really know what was going to come out of that. They just said, here's some really basic rules to govern the system. Go. Make sense? What's a good example of, of uh, deterministic? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, determinism is, um, I know exactly what's going to happen when. It's, it's a high degree of control. So it would be something like, every time you hit my website, I'm going to make you log in. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> this is probably the most important point on this slide. There is not one size fits all. So please don't be one of those people who says it's always emergent or it's always deterministic every time, all the time, no matter what, the whole thing is the same way every time. No, that is not the case. Please be more sophisticated than that um, in, in your design. So any questions about this? Have I? Would you ever do that? Why would you ever do that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it happens all the time, um, especially in technology systems. So um, this thing is non-deterministic, right? There's a few rules that govern it. Uh, first, I have to download an app, right? I have to go to my app store and, and agree to, to put it on my phone. But after that, that app can do pretty much whatever I give it permission to do. Um, and do we know in the year 2050 what will be the capabilities of this thing? If it even looks like this, probably won't. It's, it's very non-deterministic. So there's, uh, I would say there's probably more non-deterministic systems than there are deterministic systems in technology, in modern technology. So things like anyone building a platform here? Okay. Platforms are, are pretty much always non-deterministic uh, because you don't really know how someone's going to use your platform completely. And that's kind of the point. You want it to be open and flexible and non-deterministic so that lots of different market segments can use it to do whatever they're going to go do. And you monetize that. So I guess why I'm asking that question is your last statement saying not one size fits all. Uh -huh. That is pretty contradicting with the statement that Sati just made. Because we want to be open, but we know that not one size fits all. Right? So there are like two contradicting. Uh, yeah, go ahead. But it's like, response? It's like, it's like, uh, if you go back to football now, so they have like, <laughs> rules, but players can play how they want on the field. They just yeah. Makes it fun to watch, but we know what's going to happen. They all have to play within the context of the rules that 
Yeah, what that's really meant to say is um, if you keep, if you continually from project to project ap apply the same SOA governance pattern over and over and over again, that's probably uh, not the right thing to do. That's really the point of that statement. So you have to be deliberate in thinking about what am I going to govern? What am I going to influence? What am I going to let, where am I going to let it be? And what I want to do is apply patterns to those things wherever possible. I don't want to invent things. I want to, I want to be able to apply patterns to those areas deliberately. And where I'm not applying patterns and I'm not governing, I'm also doing that deliberately. That's really what that statement means. Okay. Yeah. Yes, so everything comes back to scope. What is the scope, right? Um, now let's talk about a tank for a second. Um, a tank, there are probably parts of this, uh, of a tank that are deterministic and some that are non-deterministic in a modern tank. So if I pull the trigger on the gun of a tank, would I want that to be deterministic or non-deterministic? <laughs> right. Um, now, if I'm, if I'm part of a battle, and there's communications that are, that are occurring and tactics that are, that are going out. Would I want that to be deterministic or non-deterministic? Non-deterministic. So the communication systems enable some non-determinism in the same. Now, the scope is the tank, right? So now, if the scope is just the gun of the tank, that's my only scope. Now, it's not, it's not an and or. It is an or, right? You can't have both in that one scope. I was going to ask about pulling the trigger, but what about the mechanism that has to be implemented before the trigger is actually pulled? Yeah. So part of this is service design and figuring out where should the boundary of the service occur? Where should I draw that boundary? Let's talk about a tank for a second. Where should I have a boundary? In, in other words, an encapsulation of function. Between the tank and the battle. Okay. Yeah. Between the skin of the tank and the, everything else, that's probably a good boundary to, to draw. Yeah. As a, as a high... What's that? Where? Every function? Okay. Like what? Driving the tank, yeah. shooting the gun, or arming the gun. Yeah. Yeah. Those, are, those would be the use cases. Who's involved in that use case? What kind of operator? Let's take the let's take the gun. The gunner, driver. Right, commander, commander comms. comms guy, and what are we trying to do? Do they have a common common goal? Yeah. To what? Target. Hit the target. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> do they need to function? Do those things need to function together in order to accomplish that goal? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we would draw boundaries around those functions. We would encapsulate that. If I'm the driver, do I need to know every single detail of how the gunner's job works? No, what do I need to know? What? Keep it steady. Yeah. Yeah. And only at the surface level, right? Does he need to know anything about how I'm driving? Think about it. Yeah. 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 So there is something he needs to know. Yeah, Does he, he doesn't need to know what gear I'm in necessarily, right? And when I'm going to shift and when I'm not going to shift necessarily. Maybe he does. 
but I don't know. Some of you guys may have actually done this. I don't know your experiences, but do, do you see where we can, where you draw the boundary really matters. What if we only had one boundary for a tank? That'd be pretty complex inside that thing, wouldn't it? You'd want to know about the jobs. <laughs> okay. Okay. Actually, that brings up another point in, in the architecting, right? So we, we have to consider scenarios as part of our design. And, and there are use cases that are usually sunny day scenarios. This is what we want to happen. And then there are misuse cases. And those are the things. Anyone work in the cyber domain? I heard a few people. Like this is the world we live in, right? Misuse cases. How's someone going to abuse what was originally intended, right? That's kind of the world that we live in. So what happens when the gunner dies or gets killed? You know, then what? What's you have more of an emergency danger though? So you have the like, yeah. non-deterministic capabilities of the tank and emergent behaviors, how the crew interacts with one another, and how they posture. Sure. Yeah, that could be considered an emergent behavior. This making sense, sort of? Okay. All right. So I told you, I promised you I would give you a very, very simple pattern for service-oriented architecture. This is it. So there are only three actors here, a consumer, a producer, and a man manager of that transaction. That's all that's there, that's, that's it. It's all there is to SOA. Do you think we can build an emergent system using this? Totally. It's very, very simple. We, we, now, let, let's think about this for a second. Go back to the transportation example. How would we apply this pattern to that? Who are the consumers? Okay. You got the car manufacturer as the producer. What's the manager? D DMV, <laughs> okay, at, at maybe at design time, the DMV, design time. What about at runtime? I'm driving. Uh, lights, basic simple rules, yep. So that's more of a, of a influence, because I don't have to stop, right? But what happens if I don't stop? Huh? Maybe. Maybe consequences. When would there not be a consequence? <laughs> if no one sees me <laughs> and I don't get into an accident? Yeah. What happened? What, tell me about a consequence that could occur from a manager. From a manager. I'm busted. Right, that manager just busted me in the, because he, he's a police officer and he, he saw me break the rule and now, now I'm busted, okay? Um, all right, good, let's take a technology example of this happening. What about something like Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat? Can you see the pattern? Who's who in that pattern? Take a social media, okay? <laughs> Maybe. You're actually both. You're actually both, right? If you're on Facebook, you're producing, you're telling people about you. I'm producing, but I'm also consuming. I'm learning about people in my friend group. Aren't you also managing that as well, though? Usually, if you manage your family, it's not you, got Yeah. Yeah, every time you accept a, every time you accept, uh, accept a friendship, um, you're managing. Yeah. But who's the, who's the primary manager there of that transaction? Facebook itself. So sometimes, um, off of this manager, there's a collection of all these different transactions, and those are called insights or analytics. And those are sold also. Those can be monetized. 
does Facebook do that? <laughs> Never, right? Yeah, no, they do do that. They do do that. Um, let me give you a, 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 some, another more interesting example. Anyone use Spotify? You probably won't use it after I tell you this story. Um, so Spotify is actually a, um, they are not a music streaming company. They are a cognitive science company. So um, almost all of their employees are cognitive scientists at the PhD level. Why do you think that that, that would be their employee makeup? Trend analysis. Trend analysis. So 80% of their revenue does not come from music sub subscriptions. It's only less, it's actually less than 20 like, <laughs> So you will never get a uh, targeted advertisement probably from from Spotify itself, but they will sell those insights to other companies that will advertise to you. And that's where the, the bulk of their revenue comes from that side of their business. That's <laughs> cognitive science. Is that What's that? Is that uh, both. Both. Yep. Uh, Facebook would be a, a, a pretty, I don't know how many there are at Facebook, but yeah, most of the, most of the platform companies, especially if you're using their application for free, you can pretty much guarantee that they're selling insights about you, right? So Spotify, think about this for a minute, right? Music, does that give you insight into people's moods? Yeah. What about time of day? Are there patterns there? Yeah. What about if I triangulated that to who you just talked to in your social network or what you just posted or where you just were? See how things start to get fused? Clever. It actually, yeah, it's very clever and it's, it's effective. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I told you, you'd, you can, you can go ahead and pull out your phones and delete Spotify if you want. Um, they're, and they're probably going to know that I'm speaking to you today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any questions about this? Does this make sense? This is fundamental, you gotta understand this. Any questions, yeah? I have a question, it, it is not that time to find, but I'm wondering about the arrows going to the consumer and the producer as opposed to the relationship between the consumer and the producer. Like, um, we were learning about association classes. Oh, okay. Right, so is the manager managing the relationship or are they managing each of them, each of the sides of the relationship? Uh, that's, it could be any of those. Um, this is much more generalized of a pattern. Um, but yeah, you'll, what we'll have to do is for your particular projects, you'll have to figure out precisely, you know, when and why, uh, and how these, these things talk to each other. Um, uh, there's also an external boundary here. What does that boundary represent? You think that circle, but not the circle, but this sort of open in the scope. Yeah. That says, I care about this stuff inside this line. Does it matter where I draw that boundary? Yeah, totally, okay. All right, so um, I know that was a lot. Are your brains like filled up to the max already? Or how we doing, doing okay? All right, uh, so, so a recap, um, what we did was we, we talked about governance, we talked about service orientation. If we put the two together, now we're talking SOA governance. So what were our two verbs? Control, Control influence. What are, what are the three main atomic elements of a service-oriented architecture? Yep. What, what's the fourth thing that gets drawn around them? A boundary, that, which is an indicator of scope. Okay, awesome. What are the two forms of, two schools of thought for governance? Uh, centralized and decentralized. Schools of thought. Okay. Uh, do you do all of, like, could you central, should you centralize everything? Probably not. Not a hard no, but probably not. Would you decentralize everything? Probably not. Um, so <laughs> I, heard, I heard someone say, it. this was pretty funny, let's see if I can get this right. Um, 
uh, what was it? So socialism um, uses a democracy uh, to like decentralize. To, no, to, to centralize. Uh, how does this go? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It it, it makes. Uh, forget it. Just forget it. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna totally butcher it. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's a joke that it sort of makes fun of. It basically says democracy uses like socialism at, at their at, like to accomplish their goals, and socialism uses like you know democracy to accomplish its goals. It's kind of funny. Anyway, when it's told correctly, it's funny. Um, all right. So, uh, so, so we are defining services um, with reusable functionality with well-defined interfaces. That's what a service is. It's all about the interface. We don't care what happens inside of it unless we're an engineer. Uh, so an infrastructure, we need to be able to discover, uh, we need to be able to compose things together. Uh, so what that means is um, if I have a, uh, look back to the tank, um, in order to fire the gun, I need to get in position and I need to arm the weapon and I need to press the trigger. That's a composition of three different things. Three, to, three different services, right? Make sense? Okay. Uh, and if I wanted a, a composition of win the battle, there's a whole bunch of things I would need to compose together, right? Okay, that's a composition of services. Uh, applications are built using functionality from available services. So a, a, an application, you can think of that as a conglomeration of services that are offered for use. Uh, a business architecture matches the technical architecture. So what that means is should my technical architecture be totally different from the governance of my, uh, of my business? Why not? Yeah. So let me give you, uh, now this is gonna be a little controversial, but um, I, I'm using it to illustrate a point. Um, Facebook, right? Let's talk about Facebook and Apple for a second. Two very dominant um, emergent companies, um, very different views on privacy. <laughs> uh, so Facebook has basically said, we're gonna restrict your, your language and the things that you're, you're gonna say and not say. Um, when Apple was, was pressured to crack the code on the iPhone to figure out what the terrorist was gonna do, what did they say? No, no. why do you think Tim Cook took that stance? <laughs> what would that have done for Apple's business? That was actually a really, whether you agree with it or not, that was a really smart move on his part. Because what, what he did is he looked at his technology and said, if I do this, I'm, I'm, I'm basically violating my business model with my technology model. I'm, I'm contradicting myself, right? Facebook actually, I would argue, did contradict themselves. So they're all about connecting people, letting you say what you want to say, and now they're restricting that. And that feels kind of weird, right? So wh where do you stop restricting people? Where do you start? So Zuckerberg has gotten into a little bit of hot water because it's like, why are you restricting that group and not this group? Are you biased, right? All these accusations are flying. Would it have been better for him to just say, hey, I'm not in charge of that. You guys are in charge of that, right? Would it, would it have been for his business? Whether you agree with it or not. For, for the Facebook business. It probably would have been if you just said, hands off. Yeah, but it's, it's Facebook customers, the larger side for him yeah. in the stand that he took versus going the other way. Um, I would argue he lost money and, and fa Facebook is a declining business now uh, because you can't advertise things the way you wanna advertise them in some cases. So he definitely lost some business and it's shifting over to things like Instagram and Snapchat, um, which, which, is, which is true, right? I mean, we see that happening. So um, that may not be the only reason for the decline of the business, but um, that, that certainly was a big piece of it. And there's also a trust factor, right? I mean, we, we don't, most of us trust Facebook as much as we once did. And you probably don't trust Spotify as much as you once did after I just told you. So, um, okay. So if SOA is managed well, the adoption can lead to cost efficiency, 
agility and your business process because you can recompose things very easily. You don't need to actually know exactly how things work. You can just take chunks and recompose them very quickly, easily. Uh, you can be adaptive in that sense. And then you can also encapsulate legacy investments. So you don't have to have a green, excuse me, a green field to go off and, and architect and, and services. You can take something existing and wrap a service around it and, and in that way, deal with legacy. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So the hard part is if it's managed well, and we're going to get into to vitality um, of, of your SOA governance system a little bit later. Um, so here's the scope. It's delivering value to the stakeholders. You have to be in compliance to laws and standards. Um, you, can, you can try to, you know, violate GDPR. Um, you, I mean, good luck. Uh, you, you may end up paying a very hefty fine but you have to know what you're being governed by. So um, states, do states need to comply with federal law? Well, they're supposed to. Yeah, uh, usually there's, there's a consequence to not doing that. But like, for example, with med medical marijuana, anyone have a clearance here? Yeah. Um, what happens if you, even though it's legal in the state of California, what happens if you actually use it? It's still a violation. Yep, yep, so that's, that's a little strange. Um, uh, change management. We, we talked about this. So will change occur? <laughs> For sure. Change will occur. Yes, it will. Um, what are some patterns? What's a group of patterns that we talked about that would deal with change really, really well? A way, a style of architecting. Starts, uh, yeah, which is a which is a property of of what emergence, emergence. yeah, emergence deals with change pretty well, uh, and then the quality of the services. So uh, we have to get into where do we draw that boundary? Why would we draw something that's really really small, uh, small boundary versus something that's a little bit bigger and encompassing? We'll talk about service design. Um, okay, so here are some of the things that we do when we're governing a service-oriented architecture. Uh, we have a portfolio of services. We've identified um, these are our services, and we're, this is how we're going to govern them at design time and, and at runtime. Uh, the service life cycle, there is a life cycle here. That means there's a birth, there's a life, and a death. Um, so this is another anti-pattern I see a lot is there's the birth and the life and then that's it. Uh, not, not good. Not good. Know when you want to stand down a service, right? Um, so is it this, we kind of have this problem a little bit in our country too. We have these laws in the books that are like, what the heck is that? You know, um, if I steal your oxen, I owe you, you know, whatever, five more donkeys or something like that. It's like, when does that ever happen anymore? Um, so should laws like that be kind of expunged and pushed out of the system? Yeah, probably. So they're just not enforced. Yeah. So for standard service, that's something you have to do at runtime after you start seeing a decline, or is that something you can actually plan during design? You'd want to design. You'd want to plan for it at design time to know when you cross that threshold. But when you say when, right? When doesn't have to be calendar time. It can be yes. Event trigger. Right? Yes, condition based. Yeah. When right. the number of oxen in the state falls below a certain amount. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Now, and, and also, does everything need to be governed, right? If there's one guy in the state who still has oxen, is it really worth my time to create a law for that? Is it worth your time to create a law for one guy? Prob pro probably not. Maybe, but probably not. Right? Unless you're trying to get elected to something bigger and better. Yeah. In the capitalist society, mm -hmm. we're, you know, trying to keep things alive uh, as long as we can. So, mm -hmm. would we really be standing it down as a death, or would we just try to be change management to be more contemporary with whatever the harder system is in the future? Um, uh, so, <laughs> so you could certainly change it, and and that's the whole point is reacting to to the change, right? Um, so it it may be may need to be changed, may need to be just expunged completely. But the point is we want to have a clean, healthy system where we don't have rules that are never really applicable um, because that takes up system resources. It, it creates complexity unnecessarily and it's more for us to manage as part of our portfolio. So um, if something is not in play, we should just get rid of it. 
Um, and a lot of times this takes the form of usage. Um, so like things like, um, um, uh, what is that one metric I'm trying to remember, uh, bounce rate uh, for, for websites. You know, if something has a, has a very high bounce rate, it's probably time to get rid of that thing or redesign it. So there are indicators in, in this situation, not necessarily at point in time, but indicators that would tell us, hey, this thing, maybe this thing's not needed anymore. Yeah. I think you were, gray shirt. Yeah, I, uh, I'm just going to take that one perspective too, and that in the cost associated with the talking about this, like yeah. cost associated with the like you're tracking like the numbers around the cost of the chain that and put the rule over manage it, and um, we'll find that it does encourage you to Right. There are instances too where you can charge a customer more to maintain something that's like, like Microsoft has their policy around their OS and that means like, like they start stacking up the cost of supporting the customer and that's a more efficient. And so if you're watching the numbers, you can have those numbers that can really give you more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, capitalism is, um, is an emergent system. And basically, it's kind of the strongest survive. Um, and that's OK. That's a good system. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we're, we're managing that service life cycle. That's what we just talked about. There should be a life cycle. Um, we're, we're looking at policies to restrict behavior. So policies would be um, enforcement points. If you guys ever heard of policy enforcement points, um, and uh, th those would be, where do I want to enforce this policy? Give me an example of where a policy might be enforced in a transportation system. Okay. Let's say I... So, for instance, like if you speed in the middle of downtown, that's a lot different enforcement than if you speed in the middle of the city. Yeah. Yeah. So, usually an enforcement point goes along with what's called a policy decision point also, PDP, PEP. Um, so it's where I, as an actor, have a decision to make in that system. Um, so I'm, I'm going to decide, do I want to stop for that red light or should I just go for it? So that usually coincides with an enforcement point, which looks like what? What would, what would that look like? An enforcement point. Think law enforcement. Speed trap. Yeah, yeah. Cop, cop pulls me over. Maybe a, a red light camera as a uh, sort of asynchronous enforcement point. Um, okay, monitoring the performance of services. We talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, is something just not used enough? Now, what if it's hardly anyone's using it, but it's a mission critical system, mission critical service? Would I keep it going? Pr probably yes, right? Probably yes. Um, okay, so uh, this also gets into um, chattiness of services. So if I have um, if I have two services, where's my black marker? Here it is. If I have two services, service A and service B, and I see that those two things are constantly chatting, every time someone calls A, B is called. What should I do? Should I redesign it? Probably, probably. Yeah, what could I create out of that? What? A, B. What would happen if I created a composite service? I called it C. Probably better, right? Because I'm, I'm reducing chattiness on my system. Because those things are always called together. Does that make sense? So, yeah. <laughs> so, so from a, from a Pushing out all the other, they're influencing all the other traffic within the same segment. Is that what you're talking about? And then we want to isolate that traffic. Hey, if you guys are always tracking, let me, me re-engineer you. So you can go at it, but don't bother anyone else sharing the same. Yeah, so let's think about an example of that. Um, has anyone ever used single sign-on? Yeah. Have you ever 
been, <laughs> been on the system before the single sign-on was implemented, it's pretty annoying, right? And, and there's a lot of, a lot, of um, a lot more pressure on the system to perform these, these functions. This would be a representative of single sign-on, C, because we're combining certain things together. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So we're monitoring performance of those, of those functions and those services, and we may make some changes just like we created C. We're going to implement single sign-on. Okay. Um, and then managing how and by whom services are used. Uh, that's sort of the example of that mission critical service. Yeah, only one guy is using it, but it happens to be the president of the United States, and it's for the launch sequence of the nuclear weapons. So probably we want to keep that one, right? Is there a way to keep it alive? Yeah, so like, even though, uh, let's say, one customer uses that capability, but then by modernizing it, uh, it becomes available to more, like... Uh, give me an example of modernizing. Uh, B2. B2? B2 bomber. Okay. Um, yeah, so modernizing of the, the, the example. Okay, yeah, so... Um, well, let me, let me talk a, a little bit about, so you've heard the term obfuscation. We, we may want to purposefully obfuscate certain things like um, that service that we, we, we just talked about with the president launching all the nukes and everything. We may want to obfuscate that. In other words, not let people discover it in our system. It may be hidden away from them. So, so that's another piece for us to consider is what do we want to be, what do we want public facing, discoverable? And what do we want to not be discoverable? So that, that kind of gets into what you're talking about. The, the modernization, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, not the, not the big floppy disks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, sorry. I, I get what you're saying now. Yeah, so. Um, that would be a way to do it. Um, so by having a service, uh, you know, what happens is we're defining what happens on the, on the boundary here. We're not defining what happens on the inside. So that gives you freedom to modernize and update what happens behind that boundary, right? Yeah, it is kind of crazy that we're still using like floppy disks from the early 80s in that system. <laughs> I mean, that's, it makes it harder to hack, I guess, but I don't know. Uh, okay, Whoa. that's a good one. All right, so uh, from a practitioner perspective, I know we're running long here, but I feel like that was a good discussion. and You guys are starting to get this. So hope you hope you don't mind that we're a little off schedule here. Uh, from a practitioner's perspective, so having lived through this several times, um, the meaning of success is relative. So stakeholders are gonna have different goals and motivations and values, just like we have in our government. Um, you have to understand that you, you are, by restricting things the way that you are, by dealing with certain scopes and not other scopes, you're, some people are gonna be happy about that, some people are not gonna be happy about that. And, and you need to be pretty sophisticated about how you deal with it. So, real quick, a word on that. Um, have you seen the four quadrants of, of stakeholders and how to figure out who's where? So you have, you have power here and you have interest here. Have you seen this? Okay, you have four quadrants. So you have high power, low interest. You have high power, high interest. You have low power, low interest. And you have uh, low power, high interest. Which one should I satisfy? This one, that one's most important. That's, that's the space where I wanna live. Right, high power, high interest. What, what about what? What's next? Mm. Yeah, it's hard to figure it out, right? A little bit hard. So um, now, what? What about does title come into play here? Like a person's title, position? Yeah, yeah. yeah. all the time. No, no, no. No. When would it not? When somebody has no title, but a lot. Like, like, give me an example. Like a, well, like if we're an admin, 
has a lot of power. <laughs> Great example. <laughs> Great example. Yes, th those administrative assistant people are like super powerful. Uh, in terms of their influence, right? That's a great example. Yeah, that's almost always the case. Be nice to the admins. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so you understand now who would we kind of not care about? Right? It sounds sort of mean, but... Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what? Now, where's the danger zone? Where is it? I would say it's here. Low power, high interest. I'm really, really interested. It has to be this way. It's got to be this way. Yeah, but you, you know, okay, but you really don't have any power here. Right? These, these people can, be, can make a lot of noise. And they can actually begin to influence these people if you're not careful. Right? You have a situation where you have somebody with high power that doesn't have a lot of interest that basically can do things detrimental to what you're trying to do because they have power and they don't care. I would put them here if they're working against you. It, it's just they have they have high interest, but they have high interest in their stuff that's going to impact yours, right? So I would recategorize that. Can people change categories over time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what happens when that administrative assistant is all, you know, the next day is promoted to executive vice president? Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Does this make sense? All right. This is really important. If you get this wrong in your stakeholder analysis, it will, it can, it can crush your entire effort. Yeah. Yeah, usually people who are doing the purchasing, I found in my experience, especially in the medical, because I have a little bit of medical stuff, it's totally different from anything else that I've ever been a part of. I don't know if the, the people who have been in that field could, would, would agree, but um, usually the people who are doing the purchasing are high power, low interest. Um, then you have the, the people um, who are practitioners who are usually here, but sometimes here, like unofficially here. Yeah. So um, I, I remember being literally yelled at um, because we weren't putting the, the patient's outcomes first. And that person went from here to here in that, that conversation, right? Um, so yeah, the medical field is, is, is a little weird, but usually the people who are doing the procurement, in my experience, are usually here. Yeah, when, now when, they, when you start goofing up the, the acquisition, they move from here to here. Right. So, okay. Um, so, uh, invest your time, uh, speak their language. This is a huge one. Uh, architecture people do not speak UML. Executives do not understand UML. Just please accept that as, as <laughs> some wisdom. So that is your language. Um, my recommendation is to stay true to that. Stay concordant to the UML diagrams. Don't misrepresent what you're building, but put it in their language. Your job is to help them understand and, and to capture this audience and their attention and get them on your side. So um, UML is, is, a, is a way for you to understand what you're doing is structured and is gonna behave in a certain way, but that's probably not the language of the executive that you're dealing with or the sponsor, yeah. Uh, low power, low interest. So, these are people, you really don't need to pay attention to these people, right? Because they don't have any power and they're not interested anyway. Yeah, that's okay. All right, uh, can this thing actually change? No, okay. All right, uh, so invest your, your time and energy wisely. Where should we invest our time, probably? Top right. Uh, things change, uh, so be aware of this. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen this play out. Um, this is the system, this is what we're gonna build and it's static and it never, ever, 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 ever changes no matter what. That's probably not the right approach, okay? And then techno technological determinism is real. So 
Uh, what this means is technology is deterministic and it will determine and, and constrain your system. Sometimes it, it can be helpful, sometimes it's not. So technological determinism, things like, uh, let's, let's go back 20 years ago, did we have one of these? Not, no, I don't think we did. Maybe 30, let's go back 30 years ago, to be safe. 30 years ago, did we have one of these? No, not like this. We, yeah, it's funny, we call these a phone and it's really not like a phone at all anymore. I mean, hardly anyone uses it for an actual phone. Um, did this change things? Yes, how? Yeah. Did it change our behavior? In what way? Don't have to remember everything. Yeah, we're getting dumber, right? <laughs> um, yeah, social skills are on the decline. That's, I mean, there are all kinds of studies that show that. Right, right. Yeah, so so these this this thing has determined a lot. It, it has reshaped the way we do things. Is it a good thing for us as enterprise architects? Yeah. Maybe if you use it right to accomplish your goal, right? It depends on what your goal is. Okay. That makes sense. All right. We ready for a break? Okay. All right, real quick, um, let's just do a let's do a check. <laughs> that was just my way to get you to stay five more minutes. Um, so, so why is SOAR governance needed? Why is it needed? Control and influence. Yes. What are the two schools of thought? Yes. When should we architect for governance? When? During design time, yeah, and runtime. Um, should your chosen governance pattern apply to the whole system, the whole architecture? Just the scope. Okay. Uh, all right, so the things that you should be thinking about, what portions of your architecture need to be governed, controlled or influenced? How are, which portion should be controlled? Which portion should be influenced? Who are your stakeholders? Where do they fit? And, um, and, and where, where would they accept, right? The whole point is to get this to work. So what's gonna be acceptable primarily to this group? And what's not gonna be acceptable? Yeah, we were, we were a little bit misjudged here in 1770s by, by King George, right? We had high power and high influence. He thought we were here. No, oh, no, he thought we were, yeah, here. Um, high interest, low power. Was he right? He was wrong. And he, he tried to impose a system that just didn't work because he misjudged where we were. And that didn't work for him. It didn't work out very well for him at all. Okay, let's take a break. <laughs> So 15 minutes, 10, 15. Hey. Yeah. So I've heard of... I have had been hearing of software oriented architecture, service oriented architecture for years, and just assumed that it was a general term referring to uh, the idea of having multiple services, monoliths talking to each other through interfaces. Um, I hadn't looked into it any deeper than that. Um, and for this course, we have a, a there was a book assigned. Um, yeah, Earl. Yes, one of the Earl books. Book. Two Earl books. Anyway, yep. so I read the smaller one. Um, <laughs> And uh, there was a lot more process mm -hmm. um, and um, methodology, mm -hmm. like development methodology and process in there that mm -hmm. he was associated with that term than I would have expected. Yeah. Um, and was actually a lot more uh, controversial than, 
than, than the outcome, than the, the structure of the outcome. And I wonder how much of that process in your mind is related, is actually the important part of SOA. And if yeah. so, how much of the governance ties into that? Yeah, uh, uh, most of the Earl stuff is, um, I would say his, the strength of those books is around service design. So how do you actually design a service? Do you make it coarse grain? Do you make it fine grain? When is a composition appropriate? And then we'll talk actually toward the end of the day, we'll talk about some of the patterns that are in that book. Okay, so, the, um, so you're talking about the, you said how, but you mean the outcome, the, st the, the structure of the outcome, because that like, there's like a 12 step, like a water pool, like a 12 step, like, do this and then do this and then do this. And yeah. Like, ah. yeah um, you have to work hard to convince me that that's the right way. So there, of. yeah, there, there is, I, I think if you, if you separate the, the method, yeah. what, what I think he's, he's trying to say in the book is there is a design process um, to service orientation that you have to go through, right? So it's, it's first thinking about what is the, like, first, what's the overall goal? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Or what's the thing we're trying to gain? Mm -hmm. Who's involved in that? You know, kind of what are, what are they, how are they using the system? What are the use cases? Yeah. And then typically, you know, you kind of decompose those in, into functions. Yeah. And that's where you'd encapsulate, um, it, you'd encapsulate that function in a service, typically. Yeah. Right. So, um, Earl, you're right. Um, he, he, his stuff is, is, is pretty specific. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, when everybody gets back, let, let's kind of, comp I'll do a composition that I, or a comparison between architecting and engineering that I think will be helpful. Okay. Because I think Earl gets into the engineering side a well, little more. Like the things you just said about about the identifying the problem, and I agree with that, but it seems entirely orthogonal to yeah. to SOA. Like if you if you weren't doing SOA, you'd still need to do that to do anything like a good job. And yeah. if you are doing SOA, but you have found a way to arrive at a correct understanding of the problem, you can still use his patterns and his the idea of what the interfaces should be and fine grain versus coarse grain and all of that would still be beneficial even if you didn't follow his 12 steps to get there is kind of what i'm and i'm wondering yeah. whether you, you yeah. agree okay yes yeah, I, I would agree okay yeah i would agree um I, I don't think there's any prescribed i was surprised to even find it in the book i like, think i i would say it as i would say it this way you know earl is for every strength there's a weakness right his strength is um he's a little more detailed yeah and, and, and practical, yeah. you know, I think there's, that's a strength. Yeah. The weakness is you kind of miss the theory and you, okay. it's very easy to, to take that as, oh, it has, he's saying it has to always be done this way. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Okay. Okay. Um, especially if you like, for most of us, we are never gonna have the opportunity to, like the forefathers had to just design something completely new right, from right, scratch. Right, 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 right. Um, that's not the world we live in. Right, of course. Right, so um, we are usually brought in, I mean, honestly, because there's a problem, you know, most of us get involved at, at that point. Right. And it's like, yeah, but you have to deal with all this other stuff, all this legacy stuff and tech debt that we have sure. to deal with. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, I would take it with a major grain of salt. Okay. Um, you, you make a good point. And um, I also think that he lives a lot in the engineering side, which is helpful, but it's, it's not like it's good complete. It's grounded in reality. Like the engineering. It's not complete you. though. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, and that's part of what I'm trying to do here is kind of fill in the gaps of, of yeah, Earl. That's good. Um, Cause I don't see it, it's weird. I actually don't see that covered really well anywhere else, which is why like, I can't find a book for it. Um, I don't know why, it's, okay. it's weird. Okay. It's like, I, I, but I think that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why we see such a, such a high degree of failure in, in the IT world yeah. with a lot of this stuff. Well, I think a lot of that's what the, the rest of this program is, 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 is like everything. Until this quarter, that's all it was, was the, was the context and the stakeholder management and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, I guess that's okay. I just wanted to just jump in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just for governance, uh -huh. I, what I've experienced is that folks that were trying to do the governance did not necessarily have the background to really oh, yeah. work, make it Me work, too. and it <laughs> failed. Yes. Like, they were like, oh, well, you do it. No, you do it. I mean, I literally experienced this. Like, are we kidding? Like, that, he's... They, they are doing the governance? Yeah. They are no, like, no. So I just want to see if you can, like, how important it is to have some background in what you're trying to mm -hmm. govern, right? Yeah. I just wonder. Something. Yeah, that's great. I will um, yeah. talk about that. Yeah, please. Because I just want to then, then I can use that as a reference point and say, hey, you know, we're just talking about this. This is really important. Yep. So we really should have somebody in place that really, you know, mm -hmm. has some background. 
Right. Okay. We'll do. Somehow, 
closing them in the one job has been that would be fine. Yeah. I mean that's 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 my problem is that it seems like it's gonna be a project. I don't I don't see how this is going to be a project. And so maybe maybe you can figure it out, but again it sounds to me like this is some type of project. So which uh, music app do you use? <laughs> I'm not, they probably all do the same thing, honestly, at this point. But um, I, I use Amazon Music. I'm sure they're probably doing the same thing, but I'm cheap and I get that for free, so because I'm Prime. But yeah, it's you know we all have a digital persona, and um, the trade-off is right is a convenient. You know, you're trading convenience for people get to. I mean, these technology companies really get to know you pretty well. So I, I'm not sure how if you can honestly if you can avoid it. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna get got one way or the other. Exactly, exactly. Um, 
Yep. All right, we ready to get back in the back in the swing of things here? Not really, but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, okay. So I had a I had a couple uh, requests during the break. Um, so I'm gonna go through these. I hope this is okay that we're veering away from the slides a little bit. Um, I'm really trying to fill you guys out and, and get you thinking about these things the right way. So I'm kind of letting you direct what we talk about a little bit. Is that okay? Is that work for, working for everyone? Yep. Okay. That's influence. Um, yeah. The control is 1015. We're, we're back. We're talking about stuff. Um, okay. So I have three topics that were requested. Um, and they're pretty important. So, so let's, let's go over those. First one is, what is the difference between architecture and engineering? Uh, so we'll, we'll go through that. I think that's important to understand because that's gonna tell you what, what, what things should you be architecting when it comes to SOA, which things are really left to the engineers to do, and where do those two things intersect? That's topic one. Topic two was, what's the difference between interoperability and integration? That's another question. Um, you know, those, user, those terms are used interchangeably and they actually mean very different things. Um, SOA is really about uh, interoperability as opposed to integration, not so much integration. Uh, and then the people side of governance. Um, so what happens when you, you have someone who governs who just doesn't care? You know, uh, that person is, is uh, low interest, high power, they're in charge of your whole governance system, what happens? or you have some, some other sort of weird situation. So I'll talk about situations that I've actually lived through uh, and, and what helped um, get that situ improve that situation and um, how frustrating it was to live through that. Maybe it'll be cathartic for some of you who are in similar situations, but okay. Then we'll get back to the slides. Yeah, do you have something? Okay, all right, so architecture versus engineering. Here's the way I like to do it. Um, this is gonna look like yeah, uh, you know, one of those little things that has sand go through it. So, so architecture's up here, engineering's down here. They meet in the center. This thing is called an architecture spec specification. Um, the main thing that we're doing up here is synthesis. The main thing that we're doing down here is analysis. Here, we're coming up with the whole. Here, we're breaking that thing down into its parts, okay? Do you need both? Yes, you need both. <laughs> they are fundamentally different though. So here, there's all kinds of little problems and things like that. All these little dots represent a single problem. And here, what we're gonna say is, I'm gonna deal with the problems in this space and not the ones outside. Okay, even though they may be connected in some ways, that's someone else's problem to solve. This uh, looks a lot like one of the things we talked about in our last lecture. What is that called? Scope. Scope. And it takes the form of a boundary in UML. Okay, so these are, this is the problem space. And that doesn't always mean we're solving a problem, it just means we're working on what is the overall objective goal? What's the outcome that we want? What's the desired result? That's what we're after. So another way to say it is, are we building the right thing? Are we building the right thing? Um, anyone read HBR, Harvard Business Review? You should, <laughs> it's really good. Um, so so they, they do a, a study that um, often gets updated and they look at uh, IT organization, IT within organizations. IT has an extremely high failure rate for building the wrong thing to solve a business problem. It's 80%, 80% of the time, 80% of the time we build the wrong thing. 80%, that is a huge number, yeah. This one? Architecture spec, Ar architecture specification. Sure, I'm trying to write big. I, does it need to be a little bit bigger? Okay, all right. 
I'll try to write bigger. Um, so here it's all about the right, are we building the right thing? We're, we're focused on the problem we're trying to solve. We are purposefully, it's just as much about what the problem we're trying to solve as the, as the one we're not trying to solve. And that ties into our stakeholder analysis, right? The four quadrants. Engineering, totally different. Engineering is, um, am I building the thing right? Am I building the thing right? Does it, does it, proper, does it operate properly, right? So here we're, we're dealing with the use cases. Here we're dealing with optimization of a solution. So this is a solution space. Problem, solution, right thing. Am I building the thing right? Make sense? Okay, here, these are all little point problems. Here, these are all little point solutions. It's AWS or it's Azure. Okay. You guys live here. That's where we want you to live. And maybe a little bit here <laughs> when you need to. So you'll dip down and you'll help these guys out, help them to get started. Uh, but you, you shouldn't live here all the time. And one of the questions came up about the Earl book, um, the Thomas Earl, so a governance book. Thomas Earl gets a little bit deeper into this. Okay, but what I'm trying to do is fill in the space here so you understand we're dealing with centralization, decentralization. What problem are we trying to solve? Who's involved in it? Who are the decision makers? What's their interest level? What's their power level? Do, are we building emergence? What sort of patterns are we applying to those problems? Where's our boundary? Where's the function? Th does this kind of make sense that we set a theory level for now? Okay. Understand what you're doing and where you are in this whole thing. So synthesis techniques. Synthesis techniques say, who are my stakeholders? I'm not given that right off the bat to say, here's your stakeholder list, here's their power and interest level. No, you have to go discover that. You have to figure that out. You discover that through observation, through um, talking to people, um, through formal research methods, quantitative, qualitative research. Anyone here like a PhD gone through those, those methods? You should learn those. Um, qualitative and quantitative surveys, things like that. Get to know the, the enterprise that's within your scope. Who's who? What's their interest level? What's their power level? Um, so those are the things that you're, you're trying to figure out here so that you can create um, a, a form that someone in the engineering team can go build. Okay, form follows function. Have you ever heard of that? Form follows function. Um, let me, let me do this real quick, just to, to really make this hit home. So, uh, because some of you guys are thinking, this guy, he's all about theory. Um, I'm not. So, uh, let me just kind of show you, assuming I'm connected, which I hope I am. Okay, emergent architecture, images. That looks kind of weird, right? These buildings, these are all buildings. This is an example of form follows function. Why do those buildings look that way? Form of, yeah, a practical purpose. Anyone ever been to the Guggenheim Museum? The one that spirals around where you look at works of art? Here, let's do this. Uh, uh, let's see if I'm going to spell this right. Probably not. Um, someone, does anyone know how to spell this <laughs> properly? Okay, there we go. So uh, let's take a look at that. Um, so the Guggenheim is, is this crazy looking building. Um, it looks that way for a reason. What's the purpose? What's the use case of the Guggenheim? The primary purpose. View art. So it's set up in a way that gives you the optimum space to view art. You just circle or spiral around viewing art. It's emergent. Form follows function. Okay. So your, your job is to come up with the initial form and the functions. Their job is to fill in the rest of the details to build out those functions. Okay. You, you would come up with the form that looks like that because if you were the architect for that building, what's your primary use case? 
view art. You have to, now if it wasn't view art, if it was something else, it probably wouldn't look like that. Okay, so th this is, uh, we're talking about this in systems theory, but this is not limited to systems theory. This is in building architecture, it's in all kinds of other disciplines. Okay. Make sense? Cool. All right, so there's that piece. Um, this is important for you to understand because you have to know when you're doing, when you're, when you're in which area. Can I erase this? All right. So there's that one, uh, interoperability versus integration. So here we have a system stack, system one, and we have an infrastructure, and we have a uh, we have computing, and we have services. This direction is integration. It is within a stack, a single stack. I am integrating computing into infrastructure services onto that, and into that compute environment. In, that is integration. Integration. I'm inside, right? Um, now, if I have another stack, stack two. <coughs> These services talk to those services. This is interoperability. Interop. And this is what we're concerned with in SOA. Okay? Make sense? Yeah. When you put the diagram you showed earlier with A, B, and making it C, wasn't that moving between one and the other? Like that was taking a thing that was had been interoperating and moving it into an integrated thing? Uh, so it, it, well, that's more about, I could have a whole bunch of services, A plus B and turn that into C. That could be A is over here, B is over here. And I turn that into C, although I probably wouldn't do that. Why would I, wouldn't I do that? Because many other things are talking to B besides A? Yeah, because this is, this is a pretty big lane to cross. So if I was going to do that, I may, I may go over to this partner and say, hey, actually, you have B. You can either take A or I'm going to take B. And we're going to run those things on my infrastructure over here or yours over there because we want it to be localized and optimized. OK? Good? Clear? All right. Can I erase this? <clears throat> OK. Uh, the people side of governance. Um, first, I'll give you the bad example. Um, so, uh, Cisco. Cisco, I joined Cisco when uh, it, it was really in the, the middle of a major transformation. Uh, I was hired along with a lot of other people to convert Cisco from a product company to a service-based company. Um, everybody knows Cisco gear. It's, it is heavily product-based. Um, that was uh, very difficult. So, so my job was to architect a uh, services platform because what was happening is that Cisco's patents were running out. Um, that means other people were getting into their space and their margins were becoming very minimalistic. Uh, I mean, like less than 5% on, on the margin, which is really low uh, and, and continuing to, win, to dwindle. Other, also, there was technological determinism coming in because you had things like software defined networks. So not only was the IP not protected, but you had things like SDN that were way cheaper um, and way more accessible for people to use. Um, on top of that, you had the rise of cloud computing occurring at the same time where people you know, are, are getting out of the business of building their own data centers and their own networks and just buying something from AWS or a service from somebody else. So they were outsourcing their IT, outsourcing their compute, and because of that, sales were going down. So Cisco was in a bad situation. They realized that they knew that. So they decided to invest heavily in, um, in services, uh, except they forgot a few things. <laughs> so uh, one of the things, first things I encountered was, anyone ever worked at Cisco or for Cisco or with Cisco? Okay. Yeah, their sales, did you encounter their sales? So they have some of the best salespeople in the world. Um, they are extremely high power. They're like <laughs> ultimate top right people. Extremely high power, extremely high influence. That some of those salespeople make more than the executives. Um, I worked with one salesperson uh, that made a, made a sale to Dell that was in the billions and made a 3% commission on that, uh, on that one sale. Um, these people know what they're doing. They are really powerful and really interested. 
So um, I came in, you know, to try to architect this, this services platform. And I assumed falsely um, that that sales team was incentivized. They were not. They made no commission on services sales. None. Major oversight in, in the governance system, right, by, by the executive team. Huge. It made my job pretty much impossible. Um, and, and also the job of a lot of other people. In fact, I had people, um, I had the salespeople, I remember talking actually in Seoul uh, with one of the customers there. The U.S. Army is one of Cisco's largest customers. And just getting reamed from the sales manager in that region because uh, he did not want me talking to them about services because he didn't make any money on that. Right. And, and so major oversight in the governance system. You didn't, uh, you know, that whole thing about making it acceptable. Right. I messed up because my, my first thought should have been, how is it, how am I going to satisfy that high interest, high powered group called sales? The only way to satisfy them is really to, to, for them to get incentivized through commission on services. But we missed that part. The huge oversight. It was really, really, really painful. Yeah. I would say it's both. Um, and the other, the other thing that happened is uh, they owned relationships, right? That I had, I had to kind of wedge myself in there and they didn't like that. Uh, they're a gatekeeper. They're a gatekeeper. Yeah. How do you solve this problem? <laughs> so we, we solved it by, um, and it's still ongoing to be perfectly honest. Like this is a not, this is not an easy transformation to make from product to service company. Um, IBM is usually held up as the example in the early 2000s that made that transition fairly successfully. But a lot of companies have failed, you know, like HP, Dell, you, you could argue that they didn't quite pull it off and lots of others. Um, but what we did is we, we figured out through a lot of pain and suffering um, that, that that sales component had to be incentivized. And that's what ended up happening. So they, they ended up getting... Um, at first, I think it was the same commission on product. And then we, we thought, actually, it should be higher because uh, the margin on services is like ridiculous. I, I can't go into the actual number, but it's a heck of a lot higher than, you know, 2 to 3%, way higher. Uh, so you, because of that, you can share more profit with the sales team. And now all of a sudden, there, you know, here, the, here pops up all these people. The guy from Korea was saying, hey, why don't you come back? You know, let's go talk to them about services. Um, so that's the way we handled it at Cisco. Um, that was a tough example. A, a better example is where I am now with this glue platform. Um, our CEO is a guy named Scott Beck. If, uh, if those of you who have been around remember this thing called Blockbuster Video. Um, Scott was a, um, he started Blockbuster Video and got out at the right time. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's, he, uh, he also started as co-founder of Ancestry.com, um, Boston Market, uh, Einstein Bagels, like this, it's almost boring to watch him be an entrepreneur. He's just like serial, really good at this stuff. Um, he is an example of a guy that is high power, high interest, and is pretty sophisticated in his governance of things. Um, so he gets his hands dirty. And um, if, if there's not resistance, there's, you know, extreme focus on the goal and the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, to the point where he will get rid of people if you don't get it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an example of he has thought out every possible way that people are going to block this goal and he's actively going out and crushing those things or putting systems in place to incentivize people in the direction that he wants them to go. So, um, that's, that's a much nicer environment. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever been in that environment, actually. Um, it's, it's pretty rare, I would say, but, um, you kind of know when you're in it and, uh, it's, it's great. You know, there's less for, for me to do. Uh, as an enterprise architect. So that's, it's good in that sense. Okay. So did we cover the parking lot items sufficiently? Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about governance strategies. And we're just going to talk about the, uh, the primary ones here. The idea is for you to choose the best one for your situation. This is a menu of options, and it's a suite of patterns that have been proven over time uh, to work pretty well in certain situations. So we're going to talk about the principles of, of, of governance, um, some of the considerations of your strategy. We'll talk about what doesn't work, uh, the anti-patterns, the more common ones that we see. What are the goals 
um, what are, what's the anatomy, what is, what is the composition of a SOA governance strategy, what, what needs to be there. Uh, and then we'll talk about a, the, the dominant ones that are out there, we'll compare them, and I'll give you some insider you know, tips that I've learned over the years. Uh, so here are the principles. This is all about, um, you know, again, one, no one size fits all. Uh, what we want is promote the alignment of goals, uh, the problems that we're trying to solve, and means, the IT, not just means, <laughs> right? Don't be one of those 80 percenters that focuses only on the means before you actually understand the problem you're trying to solve. This happened, I mean, I'm telling you, it's unbelievable to me, the failure rate, like 80%, would you put money against something where you're pretty sure 80% of the time you're going to lose your money. I, I'm amazed that there hasn't been more blowback in, in our sphere over, over the failure rate. It's really, really unbelievable. Um, so the other thing is we want to conform to the organization's governance and values. We talked about the business and the IT architecture. Uh, this, the, the governance form of those should match. I told you about Cisco, right? Did they match? <laughs> they did not match, and it was it was pretty painful at first. Um, so coordinate the the provider, consumer, and manager roles. You should know who those people are, uh, and how you're going to put some rules around that. Where those rules should should be enforced, uh, where the decision points will be. Um, the the roles and responsibility of of the governance stakeholders. Uh, like in Cisco, you should realize that they're this high power, high interest group of salespeople that if you don't address them, they're going to crush your whole idea. Uh, even if the executives are on board. So um, choosing the relevant patterns, um, the principles, uh, be aware of legal and industry regulations. Those are things that can kill you. So we talked about CCPA or sorry, uh, GDPR. There's also CCPR now as of January 1st in, in our state. So we have a similar set of rules, not identical, but similar uh, for privacy in our state. We're the first uh, state in the union to adopt these uh, data governance rules. So you should probably know about those if you're gonna operate in this, uh, this state. Um, tailoring the governance process. And we're gonna talk about this. These, these things are really frameworks that you need to tailor for your needs. Um, they, they do not come with everything that you're going to need out of the box. You have to tailor it to your needs. Um, categorization of management of services by portfolio. So the, this idea of a portfolio that I'm going to manage that has a life cycle to it, that has board members that have power and influence over uh, the services in it, uh, that has a, each service has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. All those different processes are going to be part of our civil governance strategy. And then uh, stakeholder concurrence, and that's continual. <laughs> it's not a one-time event. So that has to continue. And that includes the people that we are governing or the entities and things that we're governing. Governing. If we refuse to be governed, what happens in, in the state or, or in the federal government? Did you, did you, did you guys hear about the, um, uh, what is it, the Bundys? You know that story about the, the Bundys who uh, were using, I think it was uh, Bureau of Land Management land for their cattle. And they basically said, nah, we're not going to be governed by this anymore. And, and a whole bunch of other people joined them. And what happened? They had, yeah, basically there was a major confrontation and it wasn't really, there was some enforcement, but not completely of the law. Um, so things like that interrupt the system. And so we have, to, we have to be aware of what people, uh, you know, the things that we are attempting to govern will tolerate and what they won't. Okay. Uh, so governance refers to the process of an enterprise puts in place to make sure things are done right. We want things to be done the right way. Okay. Uh, so here are some considerations of done right versus done poorly. Um, if, if you're doing it right, you, you should have C-level backing. Um, if, it's, um, if it's done right, you, you want the, the business model to fit the enterprise architecture. You should be able to identify pretty cleanly who are the providers and the consumers, who are the managers. Uh, funding. Is funding important? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, some enterprises want this for free. You can't have it for free. Uh, and, and you need to be ready to message that. 
So it's really not worth doing if there's no funding put against it. Uh, our, our government would not be very effective if they didn't have a hammer where they could smack us with, you know, and, and say, oh, you're going to go to jail or you're going to, we're going to take your taxes away. Um, they have to have some skin in the game. Um, commitment to the roles and responsibilities. Uh, the example with Scott and, and the glue um, company that, that we're running right now, that's a great example of someone who's a strong champion. Um, in the Cisco example, they, they forgot a major part. So there may have been motivation, but the ability part was lacking, at least for a period of time. Um, getting the message out. Uh, anyone read John Cotter? You know that? Heard of cha change agents? Change agents? Everyone's heard that term? That comes from a guy named John Carter uh, who did some work. And, and basically what he said was in order to change an entire enterprise, uh, you really only need to change the minds of 5% of the people. And those 5%, as long as they're high power, high interest, can change the whole rest of the company. And, and that's, he proved that empirically over time since the 80s. So you don't need to convince everybody. You actually only need to convince roughly 5% if you did your stakeholder analysis correctly. More centralized, right? Centralized. Um, yes, but that's not how we work, right? That people have opinions. Um, so, th so the idea behind the change agent is I don't have relationships with everybody. I'm going to pick out the people who are high power, who are high interest, who do have the relationships, convince them, and they're going to go and often kind of spider web. Like yeah, kind of like that, sort of. What, what was the opposite? John Cotter. Okay, uh, and then realizing the benefits of SOA. Are we flexible? Are we agile? Can we turn on a dime and adjust to change? If we're, if we're doing it right, we should be able to do those things. Um, done poorly, so there's no usage of services. You stood up services, but no one's using them. That means you didn't communicate. Or maybe you built the wrong services. You, you, built, you, you, you solved the wrong problem. You didn't build the right thing. Um, no change in the business model or application development practices. So the business model uh, doesn't match what we built on the enterprise architecture side. Uh, or the application development practice isn't compatible uh, with the way that we do business. So agile, right? At this huge movement in, in agile. Um, agile, some versions of agile work really well in small companies like Scrum. Uh, but they start to not work well at all when you reach a certain number of people. So How like anyone ever, what's that? Uh huh. Oh, they don't, so they don't necessarily have a role in the funding model. So um, that's, that's part of your stakeholder analysis, but you know, usually it's a CFO ultimately that's in charge of that. Um, so the, the point of that is your work needs to be funded at an adequate level. So if you, if you are funded at such a level that you can't actually, you don't have time to figure out who the 5% are, you don't have time to engage them and convince them, it's not gonna work, right? It's just not gonna work. I mean, isn't the cost kind of getting passed down indirectly to your customers and taxing on your business units? Sort of like so how do you pay for this is your yeah, question? Yeah, exactly, right? That's, yeah. yeah. So what, what, like, from your personal experience, like how, how is one making that? Um, so from my personal experience, I will tell you my, my little secret is I, I usually use the phrase, in order to do this, you need to stop doing blank. Kill, kill one thing or set one thing. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's something I've learned over the years because typically they're, they're not doing this for a reason, which means there's some, some kind of a force or person or group of people that's resisting the change. And... Uh, it's kind of a kill two birds with one stone. So not only does the company get to move to services, but they get to kill off this thing that's resisting it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, uh, uncontrolled uses, usage of services. So if, if you have uh, 15 different discovery services, that's not good. <laughs> you should have one. Uh, be, be more disciplined. Uh, uh, the absence of an architecture. Okay, so what this means is uh, you don't really know what's going on with what you're building it's because there's always an architecture, right? Is there always structure to, to this stuff? A structure somewhere? 
Yeah. Is there behavior to it? Yeah. There's always an architecture. The question is, do you have any influence or control over it? And do you know what it is? Anyone ever lived in a world where like there, it exists, but you have no control or very little control? I have <laughs> Marine Corps. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, it's pretty frustrating when that happens. Uh, the occurrence of the SOA anti patterns, which we'll talk about, um, and not realizing the benefits of SOA. We are not agile. We are not able to turn on the dime. We are not able to adjust to change. And, and I would even add, you know, we are unable to be dominant in, in, the, in the scope that where we want to be dominant. Something is wrong. Uh, some, some typical anti-patterns, uh, the lack of a business case, we don't know the problem we're solving. Anyone ever been there? Yeah, I have lots of times. Uh, poor project management uh, is another one that's just a lack of discipline in executing things like we, like we don't have enough money to do this. We haven't figured that part out yet. Um, exceedingly complex or verbose architectures. So these things like that, that is bad. Don't do that. Um, one of the rules that I have for, for my architecture team is you should be able to draw the highest level of abstraction by memory with no help at all. Okay. So like, like Keynes, I still remember Keynes. Um, it was, it's an interior architecture. You, you have, um, uh, you have network, network infrastructure. Then you have compute infrastructure that lives on top of that. And then on top of that, you have this, you have the services, you have two cross cutting concerns, you had um, security and you had management. And that, what that says is everything at these layers is secured and managed. That's, that's it. That is the IT infrastructure uh, uh, architecture for the Navy. Super simple. And you know, we did this across roughly 300 ships and thousands of applications. It's simple. It should not look like that at the highest level. So, so applying abstraction, applying separation of concerns, right? Boundaries, service groups. Now there, there could be a, a million and there were like a whole bunch of little functional box and services underneath each one of these, that's fine. But the top layer of abstraction, you should be able to draw that from memory. And so should everybody else. That makes sense? Okay. When I see something like that, I think, oh, you really don't know what you're doing. That's what that tells me. Um, okay. Uh, lack of business processes and engineering standards. So do you know the standards that you have to adhere to? The laws and the policies and things like that. Um, inflexible systems and infrastructure. So again, is it, is it agile? That does not look agile, does it? <laughs> if I change one thing, there's like eight gil gazillion dependencies I have to figure out if I change one box here. Um, okay, this is another big one. The answer is insert your favorite SOA strategy here. What's the question? Um, so there's not a one size fits all. Uh, the mode of engagement doesn't match the system. Um, so I, for example, cloud and big data um, uh, most of us are, are using Amazon Web Services now, which is a service-oriented architecture, which is why it's called services. There's infrastructure as a service, platform as a software as a, and a whole bunch of other little things that are, aren't quite as agreed upon. Those are service-oriented. Those are all service-oriented architectures. So if, if our engagement model has our own in-house IT that's all trained on uh, server client, and that's the only thing they know, and then we're trying to move to Amazon Web Services, how well is that gonna work out? Probably not very well. Okay. Um, so the evidence to look for uh, mismanaged registries, if we have a registry that's just an absolute mess with all kinds of overlaps of concern, like 15 different discovery services, for example, no. Um, chatty services, we talked a little bit about that A and B, and we're gonna create C from that. We see those that chattiness, we're monitoring the system, that means we didn't, uh, design the services correctly, and we may want to do a composition instead. Point-to-point um, -point services are, are generally things you want to avoid. Um, services are meant to be stateless, which means they shouldn't have to remember what state a user just touched them in. 
they just do something and do it over again and over and again and over and over and over and over. There's no statefulness to it. So point to point doesn't work well for that type of a scenario. Um, SOA equals a web service. SOA is not a technology. SOA is a design um, mentality. Okay, it's an encapsulation of function. So yes, a, a, a web service is a type of SOA architecture, but there are other like the state, the states in our country is a type of service oriented architecture. Okay. Um, disconnected activity and ad hoc decision making. Uh, that means that uh, you, you know, you're, you're in a reactive mode um, to governing your system and that's really not a good thing. That means you probably don't have things like a service life cycle that you're thinking about. Um, you don't really have a plan. Okay. Any questions about the anti-patterns? The mode of engagement doesn't match the system. Mm -hmm. I feel like I come across this when we're kind of checking the new market and do a great job of entering the market and we don't follow up with the, all like the, the training, let's say, for, for, for that new product or service. Mm -hmm. That's the way I kind of read that. How do you interpret that? Well, I would agree with that. Um, I, I think it's, it's usually a symptom of not understanding the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, so really great example, everybody knows about Levi jeans. Some of you may have heard this case study. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, in the late eighties, Levi's decided to get into the designer suit market and they produced at that time, $800 suits in the late eighties, which I don't know what that would translate to now, but a lot more than $800 and it failed. Why do you think it failed? Huh? <laughs> yeah, you're gonna pay eight hundred dollars for well nowadays maybe that's what two thousand three thousand dollars something like that for a Levi's suit. Does it matter how well constructed it is? It's probably not, right? I mean, they they really didn't understand their audience very well. So to to your point, like understanding the vertical you're serving, understanding how they work. One of the things I lived through was uh, with the medical community. They care, like people really care about patient outcomes more than anything else which kind of makes sense, right? But I, I didn't think about it that way. I'm coming at this from a different point of view. And so if I had pressed my way, it wouldn't have worked. My, my method of engagement would not have worked uh, in that community because they would have outright revolted and said, what you're doing is not about the patients, right? So understanding the problem you're trying to solve the use case and the people involved. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, so the goals of the, the strategy, um, compliance with the enterprise architecture and the business goals. We, we keep saying the same thing. Is this starting to get a little repetitive? Business goals, problems we're trying to solve. That's why we're doing this. Uh, so an effective strat strategy will minimally have uh, service reuse. So the services that you create should be being reused at a pretty high rate. Um, every service should have a description. What is it? What does it do? Okay, that usually takes the form of a service contract or an API for the engineers in the room. Um, harvesting of existing services. There are probably some things that the organization has been doing that, has, that are working. Don't ignore that. Make, make sure that you build upon the things that have been working well and maybe encapsulate them into a service, but don't just say, ah, everything's junk and we need to completely start over. Probably not. That's probably not the case. Um, promoting modular assembly. That means putting things into modules, getting people to think about modules of functionality as opposed to all these things tied together. Like how can we encapsulate that into one thing? You know, we do this pretty well in or organizational systems. We have HR department, engineering, accounting. Like why can't we think that way about systems? Um, managing and monitoring of, of services. So, you, uh, you know, you have to monitor these things. Um, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. That's what an old boss of mine used to say from the Navy, uh, one of those military things. You get what you inspect, not what you expect. That was Dan Archer, by the way, in case you were wondering, Nick. Has he said that to you? No? Okay. Um, so securing services, do you, should you secure all your services? I heard someone say yes. 
you, sh you said no. Why did you say no? I agree. I agree with you. Why else would you not secure all your services? Performance, yeah. Anything else? Okay, so um, it could be it could be either one, um, but I, I an example is uh, the way Amazon was was built. We'll get into this this afternoon. Amazon originally was built, um, and I'll show you the actual email that Jeff Bezos sent to to his team that said you will all create APIs for everything you do, and they will all be public facing and and not secure or you're fired. And he fired people, a lot of people um, who didn't comply with that. Why do you think he did that? Yeah. No, I think actually he wanted, but the, the, I don't understand the secure part yet. I, I I'm getting there. That, I'm, still... I'm getting there. So, so he did that because he wanted, he wanted, first of all, he wanted to build a platform. And second of all, he, he did want to drive adoption. He wanted all those services to be exposed so that everyone would use each other's stuff. So there was no obfuscation. Now, some things are obviously secured now, right, on Amazon. Um, like what? Everything. I still don't understand. Everything's secured. Public. What? Well, I mean, like, you, you can what have secure. secure. Well, you can have internal services that are... Secured by the VPN or the okay. yeah, somebody, somebody's securing it probably, but it's can I browse without logging in? It's over at HTTPS. Well, now it is. You're right. To be fair, you're right. <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything now is. Yeah, everybody. But if you look back five years ago, was everything HTTPS just to browse? No. no. Should it be now? It probably should be now okay. because there's so many vulnerabilities. Yeah. But but if you look at five years ago, right, it, it really wasn't. And, and I mean, even now, it doesn't really need to be, right? There are some, there are some websites that, like, if you log in now, does everyone know what I'm talking about and what he's talking about, first of all? Okay, so um, if you go to any website now, the common practice now, as of, like, two years ago or so, um, is to establish a, a secure connection between your computer and the web, the, the server, now. That's a fairly recent development, though even just to browse, to do anything at all, there's, there's gonna be a secure layer that's formed, but it didn't used to be that way. It used to be all that stuff was open and you only formed that secure layer when you were doing something that required security, like paying for something. That makes sense? Yeah, that's kind of, it's kind of like that. So the discovery of Wi-Fi, like you can make your stuff undiscoverable, which is more secure, but it kind of defeats the purpose of public Wi-Fi, right? You want people to discover it. So, so there are times when you want security, sometimes when you don't, because that stuff costs you in, in terms of money, performance, complexity. Go ahead. good example is the, in the, in the DOE space, there is a sense yet of security but with the internal threat. You have where you may have a company safety that calls that we need open because mission dictates and the rules for security for that for API may limit yeah. interaction of the mission. Yeah, you may you actually, you know, if you're really nefarious, if you're in the cyberspace, you want something unsecured for another reason because you want to create a little honeypot, right? You want to attract people in and attract those bad actors in and make them think you forgot to lock something down when in fact you're just profiling them. And figuring out who they are, right? So, so there are times when not securing is the right answer. Uh, policy enforcement to services. If you if you create policies, you should have enforcement points. Oh yeah, how? Okay. Sure. Okay. All right. No problem. And it's an hour, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> At least. 
Ouch, ouch. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so you should not create policies for things that you are not planning to enforce. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so po policies typically take the form of control. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How would that fall into the term? What is it? Um, is it security by austerity? What's that? Security. Um, the term that you, you put it there, but if people do it great, if they don't, you know. Yeah. Anyone ever drive to Vegas from here? Yeah. Um, there are some stretches along the way that are there's, the policy is a certain speed limit. Do people actually go the speed limit? No, because it's not enforced. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so if you're not going to enforce it, you're not planning to enforce it. You probably shouldn't have it in the first place in most cases, uh, because there's no there's no way to enforce it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And every once in a while, they'll get someone just to make a point. Yeah. You know. And in life cycle and change management, of course, that's that's a big piece of it. We've already talked about why that's important. All right. So here's the anatomy of of, uh, of a governance strategy. Um, they all have this in common um, in one different form of another or another. They'll maybe call it something different, but they all have these phases. Some of them are a little more agile, quote unquote, which means that time period is scrunched down uh, into possibly like a sprint. Uh, but they all go through the same process. This is a systems thinking type of a process. It, this is just the way it works. So there's planning, there's design, there's implementation, control, and improvement. And rinse and repeat over and over and over and over, OK? Um, for the sake of time, I think these are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to dive deep uh, on this slide, if that's OK. All right. Um, so this, the survey of the governance strategies, these are the most dominant ones out there. We're going to talk about these a little bit deeper. The first one is the open group, uh, and that's their SOA governance technical standard. Uh, very highly used, um, probably the most commonly used. Uh, second one is, is IBM's. Um, Oracle has one, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots of others. Uh, so which, how, do you, how would you figure out which one to pick? Yeah, fit for purpose. That's right. Try it on like a shoe. Uh, if, if it fits, great. If it doesn't, don't use it. So some of the, what's that? Yeah. Cost does, and we're going to talk about that. Because like number two and three, cha-ching. Yep. Number one is, is free, at least initially, but there's a lot more work for you to do with number one. Um, so some commonalities. Uh, these are all widespread. They're all respected. Um, they're all good in their own way. Uh, this use of, a, of an enterprise service bus concept with tools to support it, that's pretty common across them all. Uh, there's attention to both runtime and design time in all of these, uh, just like we talked about. There's portions that are centralized and decentralized in most of them. Some of them are definitely <laughs> more on one side than the other, and we'll talk about that. Uh, they are created by people who have done this many times and have refined their approach. So you're getting the benefit of that. Um, the consumer and the producer model, you won't ever get away from that in a SOA governance strategy. And you can, these are technology agnostic for the most part. Um, now, IBM and Oracle obviously want you to use their technology, right? That's no big surprise. Um, so they're going to tie that pretty tightly to their technology. Um, some of the differences, uh, some heavily favor centralized, some heavily favor decentralized. Um, some of them are really highly in touch with regulatory compliance, CCPR and GDPR, HIPAA compliance, FISMA compliance, all that fun stuff. Some of them aren't 